your turn. What did you have to do to get it? I had to log everything else out. I had to get out of that website that gave me the the um anything that wasn't logging in is the to do to get it. To log everything else out. I had to get out of that website that gave me the the um Anything that wasn't logging in is the the log everything else out. So we're good to go on our end. You need to go grab stuff and turn it down, And make Casey host, and we're good. Thanks, Pat. All right. All right. Casey, I'm around if you need me. Okay, sounds good. We just got to get those other regions in. I'll get on them I'll right now. Hey, Casey, don't forget you guys are live, so you might want to mute. Okay. Yeah, I'll mute this for now. You're the, you're the host now. I'm going to get out of this meeting. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Text me if it dies. I, okay.
Good morning, just doing the sound check. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Great. Good morning, Pat. Good morning. Should I say aloha? <laughs> aloha. On there, it's really a great history of the commission. Which I thought was so yeah. great. I can hear you, Bill. Good morning. Also, we have this guy who is on our side is my son. Oh, just recently.
Yeah. Just before we start, um, we did there. Do we want it up there? We can't. No. It I just want it, but it will carry. Yeah, I, I was talking to Pat. Yeah. Good to know, too. Yeah. You'll give us a heads up when it's done. Yeah. Well, just tap the button when you're ready. And we'll just make sure that they can hear. It should. It, we just did it twice. <laughs> okay, so it's green. So, so it might be unmuted. Yeah. Yes. It, it is on. It is unmuted, so we can okay. hear you. Okay. It just went. It just went from red to green.
Commissioner Tabor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. I'm just not hearing any noise. So. Yeah, they turned off. They they're muted at headquarters. Okay. Which is probably a good thing. <laughs> Looks like they all made it. I don't see KC there yet, though. Do you? Yeah, he's there. I saw. It's just off the left side of the screen right there. Oh, okay. Looks like I'm going to have to get the non-reflective type of glasses. <laughs> Got all these little squares. guys okay i'm just gonna unmute so i just want to check with uh, commissioner Tabor and commissioner siebel make sure we can hear you if you guys want to good, good morning everybody this is pat Tabor. can you hear me yep we can thank you good morning madam chair this is commissioner siebel great thank you do the regions want to do a double check just to make sure Region one, are you on? Okay, not hearing you guys, but when I'm gonna ask you today, if you would turn off your video and then turn on your video, if you have someone to speak, that way the commissioners that are on there will take priority on the screen so I can make sure that I see them. If that works for the regional offices, please. Sorry. Testing here in Region 1. Can you hear us in Region 1? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll try to figure out how to turn off the video. Thanks. Okay, all right. Thank you. All right, so I think we'll call the meeting to order. If everyone um, would stand, we have a flag in the room here. We'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Did everyone have a chance to look at the minutes from our previous meeting? Would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes? Madam Chair, I so move. Okay, um, Commissioner Lane, Commissioner Walsh, second. Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay, thank you. All right, the expenses are next. Somebody, anybody have a chance to look at them? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, just a point of clarity here. Uh, this is Commissioner Siebel, I'm not sure exactly where to see the expenses. I didn't see them in our in our folder I dug around, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure where those expenses were. I apologize for that. Okay. Did you look, you looked in the drive, Commissioner Siebel? Uh, yes, ma'am. What about everybody else? Have you I seen didn't the? See him. Okay, we may have to move the expenses um, down. We'll uh, we'll see if we can get them to everybody before before the end of the meeting. I'm just going to move that down on the agenda. Okay, so commissioner reports. Oh, we'll go ahead, Commissioner Tabor. Do you want to start out with the, your regional report? 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So um, not a lot of activities, some, some things going on in Region 1. Um, one of the things that uh, did occur was um, when they reported the black bear uh, results from the 22 season, they indicated 834 bears taken. Um, they've gone back and they realized they had a number of um, double counted bears and actually the number is 750. Uh, which is something quite a bit different. And um, so they're going to check into as to why that happened. Um, it was still probably the best year on record in terms of harvest. Um, the other thing that uh, they, so they're gearing up for hunter's education. They're gearing up. Um, they just uh, finished up the ice fishing for the Hooked on You program. They sent 50 kids out in the field on the ice, which is kind of fun and cool. That is a very neat program. I don't know if it's as robust in the rest of the regions as it is in region one, but it's a, it's a spectacular program and it really gets kids involved and interested in fishing. Um, there is a, uh, Oh, is that me? Am I doing something wrong or, <laughs> um, the uh, other thing that's going on that's really actually a pretty an exciting project is, is up in Knox and they have an elk, a multi-year elk study program and they've already captured and collared over 50 animals. They've got ga game cameras up. They've got a number of different ways to gather data, the purpose of which is to try to really understand what's happening with the behavior of elk up in the region. Um, this Everybody's got their eyes on, uh, from the region on this study because we're trying to deeply understand the influences on elk up in region one. And I, I think most commissioners know that the populations, while they may be soaring elsewhere in the state, um, there's grave concern, not only over elk, but all the ungulates up in region one. And so this study is gonna be truly informative and allow the uh, department to go to school. Um, the department also worked very hard on some of the citizens groups and, um, uh, like other regions, is doing the appreciation dinners, um, but for the most part, I think is enjoying a little bit of the, the quiet quarter before things start gearing up for the spring and things get active again. That's all I have, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. okay, thank you. Commissioner Siebel, you want to go ahead? Thank you, Madam Chair. Similar to Region 1, uh, you know, it it, it it is actually relatively a, a busy time in Region 5, uh, maybe not compared to the rest of the year, but Starting off with wildlife, the, the, the region is, is currently uh, reviewing the mule deer and elk plan with the biologists and also uh, completed, have completed the mule deer flights, postseason flights, and, and are getting ready to start their elk flights. So excited to hear about the results of that. The snowy, big snowy mountain wildlife management area work is underway right now. Uh, the the uh, cultural survey is complete. There's been a few fences that had to be moved, but the plans are in place and we should be on schedule for that May 15th opening to the public. Uh, coming up this uh, this May. Uh, overall, in the shoulder seasons, our shoulder seasons were uh, wound down last week on February fifteenth. We have quite a few quite a few regions that went that late. And overall, I'd say it, it sounded like the it was it was fairly steady, but kind of slow because we had pretty dry and, and and relatively nice weather in January and February. And um, the other feedback we got was interesting. Of course, is that uh, landowners and hunters by by late January are kind of got, kind of ready to be done for the year. So totally understand that. On the fishery side, probably the biggest thing right now is that we're still being dominated by a three, uh, uh, processing a large volume of 310 and 124 permits. And that uh, that was as a result of the massive flooding that we had last year in 2022. So still trying to restore stream banks and, and restore channels and working with the fish, wildlife and parks on that. On the enforcement division, we're, we're, we're trying to hire a game warden in the Harlowtown region to, to backfill uh, for, for our game warden there that moved to a different position. We have some firearms training that's coming up for enforcement that also will include other uh, other FWP staff as identified uh, that that use uh, firearms or need to use firearms in the in the as part of their part of their work, and also uh, planning a tentative trophy auction in Billings in September for for the uh, confiscated trophies and possibly some old mounts uh, from the remodel of the of the office. On the, uh, the kind of cool part on the administrative side, the, the administration is planning to in Region Five. The last two weeks of March, we're going to set up our public meeting room to have hunters uh, and put the public come in to be able to uh, to be able to get help on their application process for for everything that's due the end of March. It's been pretty popular in the past. So any anyone in region five that needs help or wants to come in, 
can get in and, and can come in and get assistance from the staff there and make sure that they do their applications properly. Uh, communications, Bob Gibson, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned a couple updates ago, was retired. Uh, we found a replacement for Bob. Chrissy Webb is now going to be our new manager of communications and ed, 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 communication and education, excuse me, in Region 5. Also in the uh, Parks and Outdoor Rec Division, uh, Ryder Pagan has been named the new manager, so we have a manager there as well. And Mike Ruggles, who's our who's our uh, district or, or the uh, region manager, this is the first time he mentioned to me, this is the first time really in two years since he's been there that we actually have a full management staff at, at Region 5. So it's good times, exciting times in Region 5. And just one last thing from a commissioner activity standpoint, uh, Commissioner Walsh and I attended the, the MOGA convention in Helena in January. Uh, and in particular to listen to the, the mule deer presentation that was done on Friday and then Saturday morning, the, the uh, elk summit. And I have to say that it was really refreshing to see all the groups. Uh, this is this is MOGA, this is Farm Bureau. Uh, this was Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the Montana Wildlife Federation, sitting around the stage and talking practically about elk and, and potential solutions. So I'll, I'll say it was a, it was a well done program. I commend, uh, I commend the group at MOGA and the others that, that, that put that on. And uh, it was a, it, as I said, very constructive and very, it was, uh, it was great to see those groups coming together and uh, looking for common solutions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> so for the new commissioners, I wanna welcome uh, Commissioner uh, Burroughs and Commissioner Brooke, and I will, I'll have, I kind of, I gave Commissioner Burroughs a little bit of a heads up, but what I'd like you guys to do is just kind of give a, little uh, synopsis of yourselves and and then any regional stuff that you have uh, for an update. So if you want to go ahead, Commissioner Burroughs. Okay. Uh, gave a little bit of background on the confirmation hearing yesterday, but I'm a, a county commissioner for about 10 years now <clears throat> and uh, been working with the forest. I got appointed to the Forest Action Council, um, Ravalli County Collaborative. So <clears throat> excuse me um so just looking forward to working on the commission for the wise management of our natural resources so. thank you commissioner brooke uh, i'm Toby brooke and <clears throat> madison county and i live in gallatin county and have a business in broadwater <clears throat> county which are three of the counties in my region um i'm an avid fisherman and outdoors person and looking forward to being on the commission and talking at meeting people that have concerns in the district in the region. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lane, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'll start out with a, a wildlife area that post-season deer and elk surveys have been completed and are now being entered into the system. Uh, at first glance, elk numbers appear to be up from last year. Uh, we made it through our first shoulder season. However, we have no idea what the... Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry about that. The gears are here. <laughs> uh, we made it through our first uh, shoulder season. Unfortunately, there's no great way of knowing what the partition participation rate was or the success rate. So um, hopefully we'll get some information when surveys come in. And uh, or it's always good to hear from the public to know if they if they like the shoulder season with this being the first time. So. I would encourage some feedback to everybody out there. Uh, they did conduct two elk captures in the region. Uh, the biologists and the capture crew were able to capture nine elk in the Broadus area and then 16 in the breaks. I know a lot of effort goes into these captures, so I, I want to commend everyone involved for their hard work. I'll move over into the fisheries. Um, Mike Backus was able to finalize a temporary service agreement with a contractor to provide paddlefish cleaning services at intake there outside of Glendive for the 2023 paddlefish season. This is a great service as it, it, it provides a great service to the anglers as well as helps to collect harvest and biological data on the fish. And then repairs began this month to areas of the intake bypass channel that sustained damage from the high flow, high river flows in 2022. Um, however, all these repairs have to be completed by April 15th so as to prevent impacts to the pallid sturgeon migration. Um, going into enforcement, 
Uh, Todd Anderson and the rest of the warden's been busy with hunting season cases still popping up. It appears that there's been a lot of illegal game that has made it out of state. Um, so they're, they've got search warrants that they've been issued and so they're continuing on with this. And then also with the recent press release regarding a large case in the Jordan area, uh, many locals have been calling in to let the enforcement division know if they appreciate their efforts. Um, it's great to see this kind of feedback coming back from the community. Um, Parks and Recreation and Block Management is busy calculating hunter day data and working on the 2022 annual report. And then they will also be hosting their cooperator appreciation dinners in Miles City and Glendive at the end of this month and the beginning of next. Um, going into maintenance, they are working on an environmental assessment to the intake water distribution system improvements. Uh, the design is completed and if everything goes as scheduled, they hope to begin strict construction in July of this year. And then I just want to I just want to thank all the Region 7 staff and support crews. Uh, they do a lot of work behind the scenes that nobody ever really sees, but I just want to thank them all for their hard work in, in making every all of these years a success. So thank you all to Region 7. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lane. Commissioner Walsh. Uh, welcome everybody. Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, I uh, when I got to my rig this morning, it was two below zero. And uh, there's uh, one thing we can all be thankful for. It's been a great ice fishing season. <laughs> our uh, our four wardens have been busy on lakes and reservoirs doing fishery enforcement uh, during this season. Um, and about 40 school classrooms uh, from around region four recently took advantage of the excellent ice conditions over over the past six weeks and we're out fishing as part of fwp's hooked on fishing program uh, fishing took place near helena lewistown shelby and shoto uh, the best fishing was at east fork reservoir near lewistown where i understand several hundred perch were taken and it will be utilized this spring in school classrooms for an anatomy uh, program. Uh, the trapping season has been going well with no major issues to report. Happy to report that the demand has been very heavy for the uh, hunter education classes around the region. Um, and volunteer instructors have been scheduling in-person courses and field days. One class in Conrad filled its 30 open seats the first day it was open for registration. So hopefully we'll be doing um, more programs, more classes. Region four fishery staff have been finishing up reports and are preparing and planning for the upcoming field season. Um, our wildlife staff are working on the elk management plan and also out working to complete elk surveys. Uh, there are two perpetual conservation easement proposals currently out for public scoping. One is the Hannah Ranch in the Snowy, which ends today, um, and the Stafford Ferry in the Missouri Breaks, which will run through March 15th. Uh, the Region 4 CAC meeting last week was successful. I was unfortunately I was traveling and unable to attend. Uh, it featured uh, SWP's Deb O'Neill who always does a great job and she presented a legislative update. And I understand the biggest topic of discussion was the funding issue from marijuana taxes to Habitat Montana, which is, uh, as I understand, it's somewhat challenged right now. Uh, fishery staff are attending the Montana chapter uh, meeting of the American Fishery Society this week and uh, the wildlife staff participated in the uh, meeting of the Montana chapter of the Wildlife Society in their annual meeting last week. And at the Montana chapter of Wildlife Society's annual meeting, our R4 wildlife biologist, Brent Bonner, received the Biologist of the Year Award. And so we all congratulate Brent on that, uh, on that nice recognition. Um, on the uh, as I, many of you know, I am the chairman of the Madison River Work Group, which is uh, tasked with addressing crowding on Madison. Um, I'm happy to report that we 
we have had some uh, legislative drafts uh, being circulated and uh, and I will be calling a meeting of the Madison River Work Group shortly to review those uh, that draft legislation. Um, and I would echo uh, Commissioner Siebel's comment that the um, MOGA folks just did a great job uh, on a panel discussion on elk management. That was really helpful for both of us. And we had a, a, a good discussion on our drive back about the future of elk management. In the state. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'll do a quick uh, region six report. Um, the bio biologists completed the postseason mule deer surveys and regionally the deer populations decreased slightly from last year but remain 24% above average. Generally, northern hunting districts remained above average while the southern districts fell to below average levels and largely overlap with the drought areas where you were pretty darn short on water and grass. Um, the in-person hunter ed courses have began across the region and uh, Mark Cloker in the Glasgow office took the Glasgow area homeschoolers ice fishing and did a presentation on region six fisheries and the ice fishing derby, or ice fishing safety, sorry about that. Christmas tree project planning and organizing to improve fish habitat is occurring in region six. And uh, under the maintenance, They've been busy learning and developing the new facility management system. This system will allow managers and biologists to develop work orders for their respective WMAs, FASs, and parks. There's also two full-time maintenance worker positions that will be advertised this week. One will be based out of Haver and one will be based out of Glasgow. So if anyone's listening and they're interested in those positions, contact the Region 6 office. Uh, the landowner, the block management dinners are scheduled, which I guess there's more than just block management. The landowner appreciation dinners are scheduled for the end of February and the beginning of March. I know ours in Malta is tonight and our ranch has a foot of snow and five foot drift. So I'm not sure, <laughs> not sure what the turnout will be on that this evening. Uh, the block, as far as block management goes, the summary reports are being finalized. It was another busy year in region six and I should have a report on that for our April meeting. And that about wraps up my Region 6 report. So, um, Chair Robinson, yes. I do have a report from Region 3. You bet. They, they prepared one for sure. me. Sure, go ahead. So um, the wardens have been busy managing the winter bison migration out of Yellowstone. Um, the early snow and temperatures pushed a lot of the bison north into the Gardner area. Um, so they've had very high harvest success rates. I believe they've uh, non -tri the tribal hunts are still ongoing. The um, non-tribal hunts ended on February 15th. They've harvested about 88 bison for non-tribal hunters. We don't have numbers on the tribal hunt yet. Um, the Region 3 wardens collaborated with the Forest Service and the Park Service. Uh, to conduct a large sale, large scale saturation patrol for snowmobile recreationists over President's Day weekend. They contacted and um, visited with about a thousand snowmobilers. Um, the train trestle bridge, uh, the, the fishing access was damaged during the Yellowstone flood and that is reopened. It's um, named the Highway 89 fishing access site. Very creative name for that. Uh, <laughs> And today, um, the Region 3 staff is meeting with the governor and they're touring the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area to showcase the new Willow Creek acquisition, acquisition that the department purchased last year in partnership with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Burnett family. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, Dustin, would you like to do the director's report, please? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, appreciate all the reports from all the commissioners. Um, in headquarters here, this session is dominating everything we do for the next couple of months as we approach the halfway point trends with this next week. Um, all of our agency legislation is across from you know, one chamber to the other, so that is all in good shape. The agency's budget came through subcommittee very well. Um, we'll be in full approach in the first full week in March, so uh, that's going well. You may have seen the Fish and Wildlife Service announced that the governor's petition to view as grizzly bears on the Northern continent. Ecosystem 
uh, had merit. And so the species status review for both uh, the NCDP from our petition and the Greater Yellowstone from Wyoming, that species status assessment will be kicking off here soon. We're getting ready for the new license year, which will open um, here on March 1st. So licensing is getting ready for that. And uh, then just on behalf of Director Warsak and the entire department, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Burroughs, Commissioner Brooks, to the commission. We appreciate your service on this really important commission. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we will start, uh, Dr. Rice, if you wanna start with our first- Madam, Cha Madam Chair. Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, we did get the expense reports uh, at least emailed to us. I don't know if they were handed out to you physically, so we could vote on that if you'd like. Okay, I don't think the rest of uh, we need printouts for the rest of the. Oh, um, okay. I thought here. they handed them out to you. Okay. No, just me. I have it on my phone too. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll we'll just put it down the agenda a little bit, but thank you. Okay. Morning, commissioners. For the record, Eileen Rice, that's spelled R Y C E. Um, I'm the Fisheries Division Administrator. We have several items for you this morning. Most of them should be um, fairly easy ones, but for the benefit of the two new commissioners, I'll I'll try to give you a little bit of background so you know what we're talking about. Um, so our first item is the Future Fisheries Improvement Projects. This is the winter 23 funding cycle. Um, this is a regular item that you'll see from us. We come to you twice a year um, in February and then again in August. The Future Fisheries Improvement Program funds, habitat restoration projects, both for sport fish enhancement, as well as, as, well as native species restoration efforts. Um, the panel is a 14 member citizen review panel that's appointed by the governor. Um, and there's about $2 million in that program that's awarded annually, which is matched five dollars to one with with match dollars so it brings in a lot of match money um how it works is the review panel reviews applications and then brings recommendations to you for funding approval so this packet that i have in front of you today is from their december meeting when the panel met um, in June, the panel will meet again, and you will see those projects in August. Um, so with that, uh, you have the projects in your packet. Um, there were 11 projects submitted, 10 we're putting forward for recommendations for you today. So with that, I am happy to stand for any questions. And I do also have future fishery staff here. Um, and for the benefit of the two new commissioners, we also have our annual report. Um, with your permission, Chair, we'll yep. hand that sure. to the... Um, this is an annual report that we prepare for legislators, um, the other commissioners should already have received. If you've not, let us know and we'll take a copy. So with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, on these, that's the thing, I saw that a couple of the ones had asked for additional money just in case they didn't have enough money to make the project budget. And that is not allowed. So what happens if you have a project where you have like a fifty thousand dollar fence and it costs fifty five thousand? What happens with that? Um, Chair Robinson, Commissioners, Commissioner Brook, um, that especially currently right now with construction prices, are all of our estimates right now quite frankly are off, and um, it's really hard to guess what those. Um, projects are going to cost. So when we run into a situation like that, we do have other funding opportunities through the department or the individual will look for other grant opportunities. Um, so there might not be future fisheries money, 
But for these um, high priority projects, we do try to help provide other funds through other means. And it varies depending on the type of project, what it's for and what it might qualify for. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Somebody had entertain a motion. Mr. Madam Lane. Chair, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission to approve the Citizen Review Panel funding recommendations for the winter 2023 funding cycle for the Future Fisheries Improvement Program. Second. Okay, a second by Commissioner Burroughs. Any questions before I see if there's anyone in, that would like to comment? Okay, I will start with anyone that's present who would like to comment. Just a reminder, two minute limit on comments today. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, for the record, L-L-I-O-T-T, -T, representing Montana Stroud Unlimited, and I'll be brief this morning, if you might imagine I have a few water bills over in the legislature this morning. Uh, we stand in full support of the recommendations on the Future Fisheries Improvement Panel. I uh, spent a lot of time in the last few months in the legislature talking about future fisheries. I think Dr. Rice did a great job. Uh, in full disclosure, we're often an applicant. Um, and to receive funding through this program for a number of projects. I think what Dr. Rice mentioned in terms of the five to one match is what I wanted to talk a little bit about because this program often provides some critical seed money. Very rarely does this program ever fund an entire project. We're in the business of putting together diverse funding structure. Uh, this can be one piece. You could have another piece from a DNRC related grants, maybe some federal money uh, and then private dollars as well. So uh, $1 invested, $5 on the other side, I think is a really great return rate. Um, th this program, I think I would just highlight also, is really what I talk about a lot of win, win, win. Um, we often are hiring local contractors, so creating jobs, putting money into local rural communities. Um, oftentimes we're involved with production agriculture and helping improve irrigation infrastructure and efficiency and saving some water. And then at the end of the day, uh, having a fisheries benefit as well, which is where the hook is for us. But uh, this is a great program. Um, the last thing I would say, and I'm going to be a little bit of a broken record today, uh, uh, Fishing Outfitters Association of Montana, Dr. Bias was unable to make it because of the roads this morning. So he wanted to offer his Me Too for the Fishing Outfitters and Guides Association. So uh, with that, just would ask for a due, uh, due pass up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the commission, my name is Jeffrey Lucas, uh, L-U-K-A-S. I represent uh, Montana Wildlife Federation. I'd just like to second uh, what uh, TU said, their comments, and uh, support the future fisheries. Thank you. Thank you. Any other people present who would like to speak to it? Do we have anybody online who wants to speak? Um, if so, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands raised now. Okay. All right. Any uh, any other questions from the commission before I go out to a vote for a vote? Okay. Oh, Commissioner Just Walsh. One. I think this piece is really perfect. And I hope the communication staff uh, the press around the state. Madam Chair, I do see one with their hand raised. Okay. Yes, please. Chair Robinson, Commissioner Walsh, that's actually put together by our um, Future Fisheries Improvement Program Coordinator, Michelle McGree, who does an excellent job and she worked with her comment department on that. And that's been a, a, a huge help across the street to it. It really explains the program nicely. So I'll pass along that you appreciate it. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, I do have. Star six to our six to our six. Hello. <laughs> Hello. We, we got you. Talk. Okay. Okay. Great. My, my name is Brad Freilich and I am the chief government affairs officer 
with the Water Sports Industry Association. My colleague Lee Gatz was originally scheduled to uh, for the public comment period, but the storm has him caught on a plane, so I am doing that. We specifically would just like to comment about the sections on a couple of your waterways regarding the banning of wake surfing. And we would respectfully request that you take a different approach on that. Um, we yeah, tend to- I don't know if you can hear me, but um, yep. that is not what we have on the agenda right now. So oh, okay. that is further down in the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I thought. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. Just um, hang around until we get to okay. that on our okay. agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are there any other hands raised? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same. Okay, all opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, our next item. Um, is a paddlefish regulation proposal for the intake bypass channel. As Commissioner Lane mentioned earlier, the intake channel um, or the intake bypass channel is now operational. And um, with the exception of some damage that occurred during the flood, the channel is working very well as expected. We are seeing pallid sturgeon as well as other native species using it as a migratory channel. And in order to protect those pallid sturgeon, which are listed as an endangered species, our proposal here is to um, prohibit snagging for paddlefish specifically within the channel, primarily to protect the pallet sturgeon. We're concerned about um, um, incidental take or damage to the pallet sturgeon during the paddlefish season. And for those of you not familiar with paddlefish snagging, it involves a very heavy, very large treble hook. Um, pallet sturgeon primarily are on the bottom. Um, and could easily be snagged by these large treble hooks. Um, during public comment period, we received 10 comments, six in support, four in opposition, opposition. The four in opposition primarily spoke to loss of opportunity. So I did want to emphasize that this is specifically for the intake channel and will not impact paddlefish snagging anywhere else in the, in the system. So. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And we also have Mike Backus in Region 7 available too. Okay. All right. Are there any questions from the commission? Mm -hmm. oh, Commissioner Walsh. Chair Robinson, I, I just had one question. And that's one of the comments was to cut down trees to create more fishing opportunity in the main channel. Is that, uh, I haven't been to this site, so I, I don't know what, what it looks like, but it's, is there an opportunity to increase opportunity uh, outside of the bypass channel? Uh, Chair Robinson, commissioners, Commissioner Walsh. Um, yes, I, I, I saw that comment and I, I've been to the site and I'm not actually sure what opportunity would be created by cutting down trees and producing more bank area. Um, Obviously, you know, fisheries, we do have concerns over um, stream bank protection and oftentimes those trees provide an important role at protecting the stream bank. Um, so with our evaluation, we, we don't see that as a way to provide additional opportunity. Um, we, there are plenty of places along the Yellowstone where bank fishing can occur. Go ahead, Commissioner Lane. Uh, is it my understanding there will be sufficient signage and everything should this go through to where people just to for enforcement purposes? So that, okay. Chair Robinson, Commissioners, Commissioner Lane. Um, yes, I probably should have mentioned our 2023 regulation booklet is obviously already 
printed for the new season starting March 1. So we won't be able to get it in the booklet, but um, as you're probably aware, the, the intake bypass channel is a, a discrete part of the Yellowstone and it will be fairly easy to sign in addition to um, press releases and other outreach to ensure the public are aware of it. Thank you. Mr. Washington, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission prohibit snagging of paddlefish within the intake fish bypass uh, channel as proposed by the department. Second. Okay, second by Commissioner Lane. Any other questions? Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to comment? Good morning again, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Clayton Elliott, ELO, IOTT, representing Montana Trout Unlimited, and I'll try not to refer to any bill members at this time. Uh, <laughs> but it, stand in support of this regulation, you may ask why Trout Unlimited is involved. We've been engaged in the conversation and the work uh, on lower intake for some time. Um, with the, the intake bypass, uh, we think this is a responsible regulation to move forward. We spent a lot of time, money, energy to make this intake work. Uh, at the very least, we can give that those fish a, a free passage and safe passage as they move through there. Um, this was, for a little bit of backstory, this was part of the regulation booklet that we were considering last summer, late, um, early uh, fall, and uh, saw this as one maybe potential casualty in, in the responsible way to take that whole regulation book and put it behind the development of the fish plan. But as we move into the spring season, we think this is a responsible one to to move forward with. So we would just ask for your support on this regulation change. I think it's common sense. Okay, thank you. Any other commenters? Okay. All right, there's no other comments. Is uh, any other questions before we go to a vote? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. All opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carries. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, our next item includes two regulation proposals. Um, as I previously mentioned, our regulation booklet is already printed. Um, so I will start by saying if these were to pass, um, we will do the same here with signage and other outreach to make sure the public are aware of any regulation changes. So these two regulations fall under the Upper Missouri River and Reservoir Management Plan. And again, for the benefit of our, our two new commissioners, I'm going to give a, a brief background on that management plan before I go into the specifics of the two regulation proposals. Um, and I understand that there's likely going to be some significant comments, so I, I will try to keep this brief. Um, the management plan covers Canyon Ferry Reservoir, Hauser Reservoir, Holter Reservoir, and the Missouri River from Tostin to Canyon Ferry and Hauser Dam to Upper Holter Reservoir. The plan outlines management goals and objectives and provides recommended management actions when species specific abundance or size structure goals are not achieved. Management plans for specific waters are typically developed to provide the department and decision makers with guidance on management strategies using an extensive public process. They are often developed on waters to ensure all interests are represented, particularly in those waters where balancing a variety of interests can be challenging. The current Upper Missouri plan has been in place since 2020, with public involvement starting in 2018, which included two citizen work groups, eight open houses, four public meetings, an extensive online survey, and in, in addition to several smaller informal meetings, which often included at the time Commissioner Stuker, um, who was in, heavily involved in the development of that plan. We are fortunate today to have some of the key representatives um, who were involved in the development of the plan, and I'm sure you'll be hearing from them during public comment. When approved by the commission, the plan was well supported 
and is used to guide management actions throughout the Upper Missouri Reservoirs and River stretches. A citizens advisory committee was established by the management plan with members appointed by the commission. Annually, the staff present to the citizens advisory commission the current trends in the fisheries and any proposed regulation changes um, which last occurred in December. The two department regulation proposals in front of you today are based on the direction from the management plan and use the best available science and information from our fisheries management biologists. And I do have our two biologists available for questions if needed. The first proposal is for yellow perch on Holter Reservoir and proposes to change the possession limit from 25 to 50. The daily limit would stay the same at 25 perch per day. The goal for perch as described in the management plan is for eight to 12 perch per net. And currently the perch abundance is at 32 perch per net. Under these conditions, the plan suggests a more liberal limit to maximize fishing opportunity. At the CAC meeting in December, the members supported the proposal with the exception of one member preferring a more liberal harvest limit. The second proposed regulation change is for walleye from Tostin Dam downstream to the Highway 287 bridge. The current regulation is for 10 walleye daily with one over 15 inches. The department is proposing to change that to the central district standard, which is five walleye um, with no size restrictions. As outlined in the management plan, the goal for walleye in this section is to rely on migratory walleye to supplement the fishery while minimizing impacts on existing trout and forage species. Walleye are a piscivorous fish. Our concerns come from the primary goal of the management plan is to manage that section of the river as a wild trout fishery, which is in the current plan and was not disputed during plan development. We have concerns over walleye congregating at the mouths of tributaries where trout are spawning and out migrating. We have also found walleye within a screw trap on Deep Creek which is used to monitor fry development from both brown trout and rainbow trout. Um, our number of walleye that we found in the screw trap is fairly small, although the way the screw trap is designed, it's designed to release large fish. So it could be that other walleye have gotten into the trap and um, subsequently escaped. Um, that's how the trap is designed. It's designed to hold smaller fish. The modest recommendation of the central district standard of five walleye daily is intended to remove some of the predation from the walleye for, from the trout fishery, as well as recognizing the importance of the walleye fishery within that system. The river, of course, is part of the walleye fishery that's in Canyon Ferry, although the information from our biologists is that this regulation change would not have an impact on the walleye fishery within Canyon Ferry Reservoir. Um, with that, an acknowledgement that there will be um, significant public comment Myself and staff are available to answer any further questions. We can also provide additional analysis on any amendments provided by the commissioners. 
So with that, I'd be happy to stand for questions. Okay. I just want to start out with some clarification too. So this is an amendment to the regulations that are in place. So if we did no action, then they, they would stay as is, correct? Chair Robinson, that is correct. So with no action, the current, li current limit on that river section is 10 walleye daily, one over 50. Okay. And, and that would stay in place. And the perch also. And yeah. the perch would remain at 25 daily, 25 in possession. Okay. On Holker. Okay. So I just want to start with, I do have an amendment that's in here. Um, I talked to uh, fisheries to just kind of work out what would possibly be um, mean in the middle on the, the walleye limit. I, because I am chair, I'm not going to go forward with that amendment. If somebody else chooses to, that's fine. But I think um, I just wanted it on the table as a possibility and and I'm just going to open it up for any questions from anybody and start the conversation. But just to get the ball rolling here, um, I, it feels to me like we'd address these two, the perch and the walleye separately. Yep. So I moved the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the, uh, the fishing regulation for Holter Reservoir for yellow perch, the 25 daily and 50 in possession from Boston downstream to Highway 287 Bridge. All right. Is there a second? Um, Madam Chair. I yes. Madam yes. Chair. I think that uh, what Commissioner Walsh added in the end was actually the walleye regulation, the tossed and yeah, down down right. the highway. So so scratch that and okay. I'll second it. Okay, so just stop it at possession. Yep. Right, and it only applies I'll, I'll if we go. Okay, go ahead and reread it. Yep, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Siebel. I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt her, uh, the fishing regulation for Tostin downstream to Highway 287 Bridge north of Townsend for, oh, pardon me. <laughs> Start yeah, at the I'm beginning. <laughs> yeah, I, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the, uh, the fishing regular, regulation for Holter Reservoir for yellow perch to 25 daily and 50 in possession. Period. Okay. Second. Okay, and that's Okay, Commissioner Siebel seconds that. Okay. Are there any comments or questions from anyone on any either one of these? Madam Chair. Yeah, Commissioner Siebel. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Are we gonna are we gonna do questions on the the walleye? Yes. Uh, proposal yes, right now as well. Okay. Yes. I have a question for Dr. Rice then, Madam Chair. Chair Robinson, oh. Madam Chair, Dr. Rice, uh, I, I recall that we had, we, we, this came up, I believe, and this is, I think there's four of us still in the commission that this came up in April of 2021 at our commission meeting, something very similar. And I wasn't able to go back and pull the minutes from that. But the, I, I guess my, my big question is, is what's changed since April? What, what we ended up approving, as I recall, in April of 21 was essentially applying the same rules to the reservoir as the river. And I do recall there being a discussion about the difficulty of enforcing, especially with with boats moving in and out of the reservoir and up the river, the difficulty of enforcing that and, and this this regulation having different rules between the river and the reservoir. But I guess I would ask, uh, what what has changed? Has anything changed significantly since April 21 when we made that decision? Chair Robinson, Commissioners, Commissioner Siebel, um, you are correct. Um, at the time, the department um, suggested three, uh, three options for the regulation. Um, one was to keep the regulation the same as the reservoir. One was to go with what we're proposing today, um, the five or the central district standard, which is five walleye daily. And the third one was or no, the, the third one was 10 fish one oh the third oh sorry um the third was 10 fish one over 20. um commissioner siebel you're correct my recollection of the discussion at the time was the decision was made to keep the reservoir and the river the same and primarily due to concerns over enforcement um, over the last few months, fisheries has had several conversations 
with enforcement um, and, and the enforcement staff are confident with that um, designation of the regulation being from Tostin Dam to the Highway 287 bridge, they're confident that they will be able to regulate it um, and enforce it easily. Um, it's not unusual for us to have different regulations between river stretches and reservoirs. It's actually fairly common and there's several examples within the regulation booklet where that occurs. In terms of what's changed population wise, we have the same concerns now as we did then, but what we're seeing is the walleye population in the river continues to increase in size. Um, and we are catching more fish going into the traps and Deep Creek. And, and one thing I failed to mention about Deep Creek, the reason that is so significant, as we discussed earlier in the Future Fisheries Improvement Program, several future fisheries projects have occurred on Deep Creek um, related to both water and fisheries habitat. And purposely to protect um, trout spawning within that within that creek. And for anyone familiar with that drainage, Deep Creek is the primary creek for um, trout spawning in that section. So I I hope Commissioner Siebel that that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rice. Follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Rice. I guess just. Please educate me on uh, the, the current regulation is, is 10 fish per day, one over 15 inches, and, and uh, I believe it's two times the amount in, in possession. And what's being proposed is five with no size limit. And I guess from a, from a layman's perspective, if you're worried about population, it seems to me that 10 per day and 20 in possession is better than, than five. I realize this has to do with size. And then my second question is, how can we say that this won't impact the reservoir fishery if we're, if we're assuming that these are fish that are being, that are migrating in and out of the reservoir. Chair Robinson, commissioners, Commissioner Siebel, take the first question, um, the question first so that I've already forgotten. The size. Oh, no, the size. Ten, ten ver Sorry. Five versus 10 for population. 10, ten second recall. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. So the current regulation is 10, um, one over 15. And um, with the current size structure in the river, um, there really aren't um, many fish under the 15 inches. So the 10 daily one over 15 is essentially a one fish limit. Um, changing it to five daily um, with no size limit, um, the majority of the population is made up of fish that are 15 inches or over. Um, so it's it's essentially changing from one walleye daily to five daily. Um, so that's that's where um, the increase in harvest comes from. And this was part of our discussion um, the last time this came in front of you. The size the size limit regulation was put in place specifically to manage. Um, the fishery on the reservoir. Um, we don't have the same size structure on the river because it's primarily the larger walleye that are running up the river. Um, which gets to your second part of the question. It's a small portion of the Canyon Ferry reservoir population that runs up the river. Um, and from our biologist, Adam Strainer, um, who works on Canyon Ferry, there's no information to suggest that going to the five walleye daily on the river would impact the Canyon Ferry population. With that being said, the management plan is still in place. And we do have those guidelines within the management plan that are reviewed annually. And if there are changes to the Canyon Ferry population, we'll be back in front of you with a regulation adjustment. Okay, Commissioner Tabor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Dr. Rice, um, 
this somewhat reminds me of some of the other issues where we are now drilling down into what feels like competitive value systems for different types of fisheries um, pre reconstituted fish plan. And so, so um, I should probably not do two questions at you, but I'm going to do it anyway. The, the first question comes down to is your proposed new fishing plan that I believe will be seen sometime in the spring. You know, I, I think myself and other commissioners have encouraged that we get into a value system based um, predication so that we can get prescriptive by body of water. And so in this case, what it appears, especially looking at the preponderance of opposition to it is that we kind of have the walleye people against the trout people, which, which then in some ways necessitates us trying to decide what is our real goal here, you know, perpetuation and protection of the walleye population or the trout population or both. Um, so will the new plan have much more specificity in terms of a value system and everything else that'll guide and direct us for a decision like this. And if, if that's the case, would it be prudent like we did on a few of the decisions last fall, wait until the plan has gone through the scoping process and public and everything else before we make a final determination? Um, so I, I think I'll just leave it at that question and then Madam Chair, I might have a couple of follow-ups. Okay. Chair Robinson, Commissioners, Commissioner Tabor. Um, so as I mentioned, this system has its own management plan. And we do have several waters with their own management plan. Um, this plan has been in place for several years. And like I mentioned, the last time the Upper Missouri River Reservoir Plan um, was in front of you was when it was approved in 2020. And it gets to exactly what you're talking about, this value system and um, competing interests between um, walleye anglers and trout anglers. And that's why for the development of this plan, we went through a very extensive public process. So in this situation, waiting for the statewide plan, um, it, I would argue wouldn't make any difference because the statewide plan actually refers back to the river reservoir plan. So in those situations where we have a water body specific plan that supersedes the statewide plan. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, a follow up. Yeah, go ahead. So then with regards to the, the chair's proposal uh, uh, as, as a bit of a compromise, the department did make a, a comment relative to that, and it gets back to the size class. Um, so, so make it simple for me, why wouldn't we just, uh, I'm, I'm still a little stumped in terms of what our real concern is. Are we not harvesting enough fish or are we harvesting too many when it comes to walleye? It sounds like there's only essentially over 15 inches in the area affected, why don't we just make it 10 and not have a size limit at all? Um, or in a lot of waters, you know, and I'm, I was talking to Commissioner Siebel about this, like taking federal waters and looking at how they manage species like uh, halibut, you know, maybe, maybe we do it the reverse way and say that in order to have so many large, you have to, to retain so many small or vice versa, you know, so that you have the kind of mixture or whatever goal you're really trying to accomplish here in terms of a population base. So I'm just curious about your professional opinion in that regard. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, Chair or Vice Chair Tabor. Um, so our goal here is to manage um, the walleye as a piscivorous fish. The management plan clearly states that wild trout are the priority for that stretch of river. Um, you mentioned why not go for a 10 fish limit. The reason we're going for the more modest um, central district standard of five daily is to recognize the importance of walleye. If we truly wanted to um, harvest as many walleye as we could, we would 
introduce uh, a higher regulation. And, and in the past, um, we've had that on other waters. Um, so the goal here is to manage the predation on the rainbow trout while also recognizing the importance of walleye as its own fishery. Um, the reason we're suggesting um, eliminate the size restriction is because it's, it's really not necessary as a management um, tool. Um, so where, where we do have size restrictions, they have a lot of different reasons. And um, you mentioned halibut management. So um, sometimes what we'll do, like for instance, on Canyon Ferry um, with the one over 15, what we're trying to do there is increase harvest of smaller fish in order to balance out the population so as we have a more desirable size structure. Um, manipulating the, the size of the fish on the river is unnecessary because the majority of them are over 15 inches. So hopefully that helps explain it a little better. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I think Commissioner Lane said his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Rice, I, I've just I've been trying to go through all the data that's been out there, and I still haven't seen any true proof that there is significant predation from the walleye towards a trout. Mm -hmm. And yet, I've seen what some I didn't remember if it was last year, or the year before, the the tagged fish that you've had. That thirty nine percent of those ended up in pelican nests. So it seems to me like we have several issues we need to deal with. And so, but as far as, I mean, I know you said you have, you were catching them in the traps, but that doesn't prove predation. Chair Robinson, commissioners, Commissioner Lane, um, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, we have not done stomach analysis. Um, and part of the reason is it's, it's a fatal, test, <laughs> slice open their belly and pull out their stomach. So we haven't done that. Um, at a recent meeting that we were invited to at the Rod and Gun Club in Townsend, that same question was brought up. And um, we, are, we are more than happy to conduct that work this year. Um, our concern, though, is um, it you you can't argue the fact that walleye eat other fish. Um, and they're definitely keying in on the areas where the juvenile trout are out migrating. Um, walleye, um, if, if you look at a walleye, they're designed for eating fish. You know, you, that's, it's, it's fish anatomy. If you look at their mouth, their teeth point backwards, large gape, um, they're designed for eating fish. Um, so our, our concern is with seeing more walleye, specifically in these areas where we're, see, where we're trying to protect the out-migrating trout, we're trying to um, promote trout spawning success, um, we're concerned, but you're, you're absolutely correct. I, I do not have evidence that any of those walleye have trout in their stomachs, but we're more than happy to do that work this year knowing that it will result in um, a fatal sampling method. Right, right. I have a follow-up. Yeah, go ahead. I actually have two questions. What is piscivorous? <laughs> <laughs> I had to look that up too. <laughs> sure, Robinson commissioners, I, I apologize. Um, I, yeah, sincerely, I apologize. We forget, we get into our own speak. <laughs> Um, piscivorous means to eat other fish. Okay. So herbivorous, vegetarians, omnivorous, to eat anything. Piscivorous, to eat Pisces. fish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess my, then my, so that clears that up. My follow-up question was, are you seeing significant changes in the populations of the trout? Um, Chair Robinson, Commissioner Lane, um, 
the the trout population in that stretch of the river has has never been a you know outstanding world class fishery and and I'll start the answer and with your permission I'll defer it to our local biologist who can add more um, but we both the brown trout and rainbow trout are are in very low numbers in in that stretch of the river but in terms of trend data I know Ron Spoon is here there he's in the back we didn't recognize him because he's cleaned up um, <laughs> with your permission chair robinson i defer that to mr spoon who is the fisheries management biologist for that stretch out of the townsend office okay thank you uh, madam chair um Commissioners, I'm Ron Spoon. I work the river upstream of Canyon Ferry. And the question was related to the trout population and whether it's been an impact due to walleye. And I'd like to just back up a hair. I've, I've been there a long time. So I, um, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, that stretch of river was given a water right called the Murphy right. It was given to 12 rivers in Montana because of their high quality trout fisheries. And uh, it's gone. Basically, it's at a remnant of what it used to be. It has nothing to do with walleye. It's, uh, we ran out of water. Uh, the low flows of the last few years have really reduced that population. So the, the, uh, the walleye population is not hurting because of regulation. It, it ran out of food. And the trout are hurting because they ran out of water. And we're trying to balance these two issues that are going on. The regulations will not cure that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going away from the question, but it's um, when we inadvertently had a one fish limit imposed on walleye, the one over 15, that sent a message that we're um, taking a very conservative approach on walleye. And that, I don't think that was the intention really. And so we're just we're trying to correct that it should be more balanced uh, type of harvest. But, um, the trout numbers are low. They didn't used to be 30 years ago, but it's mainly a water. Thank you. Yeah. So trending data, is it coming up? Is it average? It's below our goal for brown trout. It, it kind of bounces around. Three years ago, it was above our goal. So right now it's slightly below our goal. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Walsh, did you have your hand up? No, okay. Commissioner Lane asked my question. Okay, um, Commissioner Siebel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick uh, follow up for the department. We got we have several comments. I want to thank the public for for commenting on this. This is probably the most commented topic on our agenda. And I guess one of the and this is for Dr. Reiser. And I apologize, I missed the gentleman's name that's just at the podium. We got a lot of comments and a lot of data supporting the fact that uh, number one, that the majority, you know, that that there's still less than 50% on the two-year average of the fish or less than they use 16 inches. But we saw a lot of data in the, in the comments, some coming from all unlimited and others that uh, that that contradicted a lot of what we're saying here. And I guess I'd just like the department to, I am assuming you read those comments, Dr. Rice, and I'd like the department to comment on those, you know, plus the Plus the movement of fish in and out of the reservoir. There, there was a lot of data presented and, and a lot of it is way over my head, but I'd like the department to comment on what seems to be contradictory data from what we're hearing from the department. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, um, Commissioner Siebel, um, with your permission, I'd like to take the last question first. Um, and with your permission, can I defer that to our reservoir biologist, Adam Strainer? who's in the Great Falls office. Adam has done a lot of work um, looking at the Canyon Ferry walleye population and how it interacts with the river. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, add it, I'll turn it over to Mr. Strainer. So Adam, can you take that? Yes, thank you, Eileen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, um, speaking directly to the interactions of the walleye population from Canyon Ferry Reservoir and the river upstream. <clears throat> my understanding of that population is that 
a portion of the candy fairy walleye population migrates into the river upstream annually and then out migrates to the reservoir annually. To what extent we are is an unknown. Um, and also, I'd like to point out that the timing of a lot of our surveys in the reservoir, which is what I'm accustomed to, mo uh, to monitoring for management of Canyon Ferry, um, the fish that are not present when we do our primary surveys in the reservoir are simply that. Um, they're, they're not available at that time to be sampled or surveyed in the reservoir. Therefore, it's our best understanding right now that there is no good way for us to um, fully understand the implications of increasing harvest in the river on the Canyon Ferry uh, walleye population as a whole. Commissioner Siegel, did you have a follow-up? Um, Madam Chair, I guess I appreciate that uh, I, from Mr. Strainer. And uh, I guess the rest of my question was just in general, the data that was presented from electroshock data and others, including that migratory data, but even the age population data that seems to be somewhat contradictory as far as you know uh, the, the the age and size of the fish in the river and the timing. I guess I'd just like to hear the department's response to that or in general. Yeah. Chair Robinson, members of the commission. Yeah, just to be clear, the this area that we're talking about, the river is covered by Mr. Spoon, the reservoir is covered by Mr. Strainer. So I'd like to turn it back to Mr. Spoon to answer that question specifically about the walleye population structure in the river. Madam Chair, Commissioner uh, Ron Spoon, S-P-O-O-N. Um, so the, um, the walleye information <clears throat> moving into the river is actually quite simple, even though we've inundated you with a lot of graphs. But, um, um, while I have been in Canyon Ferry since uh, about 1990, uh, and it took them 16 years to start moving into the river in large numbers. So the first walleye we really saw was in 2015. We did see one fish in 2007, but it was kind of an extraneous thing. Um, so now um, once a week, we do a very um, um, kind of low effort, but uh, frequent sort of sampling just to gauge those fish moving into the river. And uh, so you'll see that we have what we call catch per effort data. And it's been fairly stable uh, since 2017 in terms of just fish that are moving through into the river. Um, and uh, we do the same thing for trout, but we do that in the fall in a different section of the river. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. Structure of the oh, so, so the, uh, then, then the, <clears throat> regarding the size structure of those fish, um, you know, um, we sent a lot of what we call length frequencies to you that show that it's um, considerably larger than the fish that you see in the reservoir. Um, you'll see a little batch of um, one or two year olds that are about 13 inches, but most of the fish are actually over 15 inches. That's why this current regulation results in what's sort of a de facto 15 inch um, or, or one fish limit because most of the fish are over 15 inches. All right, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Rook. Um, Mr. Spoon. Mr. Spoon. Sorry. Um, I was wondering um, if what are, if why are the walleye going into the river? Are they eating other walleye or are they, I mean, they're, they're eating fish. So what are they eating if not other fish? Right. Uh, so Commissioner Brook, the, uh, as uh, Dr. Rice said, we, we have not been doing any diet analysis. That's mm -hmm. what we would normally do to figure that out. But um, we know what they're not doing, which is they're not, they, they've already spawned before they come into the river. Um, we sample before they come in in April, and then we see them move in after that. And, the females are spent. They've already spawned in the lake um, on the south end. And we've been assuming they move in for a, a foraging exercise. You know, there's probably more small fish available in the river than there, are, <clears throat> there is in the lake in some cases. Uh, the, 
we have sucker and perch and other forage data in the lake. And we, we've seen that, that those populations crash you know, about 10 years ago. And that coincides basically when we see walleye start to move into the river, probably looking for food. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Siebel. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Spoon, just a quick question on if, if we're going to do a survey on what these walleye in the river are eating, is it possible to incorporate the actual catch the catch from the anglers in the river to to look at what's in the stomach without having to have the department do it and kill the fish? Commissioner Siebel, um, I've not talked to my uh, counterparts on this, but we, we do intend to do a creel census um, on the river this year and be my preference to do diet analysis with creel census. And I don't really want to go out sampling and killing walleye to determine diet when I, I kind of know what I think I'll find. So when the creel census to use those fish that have already been caught would be something I think would be a good idea. Thank you. Any further Thanks. questions? Okay. Oh, Commissioner Siebel. Um, Madam Chair, I just, uh... I'm not going to make a motion. I guess I'd like to recommend to the commission that we take no action on this at this time. I'd like, I'd certainly like to see additional information. It just seems like there's a lot of contradictory information here, and 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 there's obviously a lot of opinion against this. And I'm not really sure what problem we're solving at this point in time without without more information. So I'm going to recommend that we take no action on on the walleye at this time as a, as a commission. Okay. Commissioner Walsh, I, I just wondered if we should move forward with the vote on yellow perch and then. And then we can decide what we do with them. I well, I'd rather because I if we'll have to go out for public comment, I'd rather have both on the table if we're going to have a motion. Madam Chair, I wonder we're getting a, a few complaints about the sound. I wonder if we could pause for just a minute. Let sure. Mackenzie move the mic before we go to public comment. Yes. <clears throat> I want to pass these out. This is the expenses. Thank you. That any better? Whoever was it's page two. Oh, so it should be better. Sorry, I was trying to be more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a text. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess I'm just going to make sure that there is no motion before we go out for comment. Madam Chair, just one question. So it sounds like essentially the proposal was to increase the harvest from one to five. Um, I don't know the biology and um, uh, well, essentially one to five, just because of the size structure, mm -hmm. we would be keeping five fish. Essentially, that that's what the limit would be. No, wait, it's one. Well, it's 10 with one over 15. It's inches. 10 with one over 15 now, but we were saying five with no limit. So essentially what I heard was is we're, we're if this proposal was to move forward, we would go from one, essentially one, because that's the size class to now five keep fish, because that, you know, you can keep five fish any over 15 inches. We're essentially going from one to five keep fish. Um, I don't know the biology and how that works as far as I would guess that those larger fish are more responsible for proliferation of the, the population. I don't know when walleye start if it's that mm -hmm. one to two year old at 13 inches start to to lay eggs and are are responsible for you know increasing the population i don't know how that works but i i guess i would just like reassurance that basically increasing the keep limit to five times what it is now is not going to you know start to drive the population down chair robinson and um, commissioner burrows um that's exactly why we're proposing a, a modest regulation of, of the central district standard. So uh, a couple of key things for your question. First, it, it's a small portion of the Canyon Ferry Reservoir population that's moving up the river. Um, so there are um, still um, adults present in the reservoir that never go up the river. Um, as Mr. Spoon mentioned, um, the adults don't start moving up the river until after they spawn. They spawn 
sort of early spring, March, April-ish time, and then it's later that they start moving up the river. Um, the second point I, I will make is, is this is not um, a suppression um, action at all for walleye. We are not trying to impact the population in the reservoir. We're still managing that reservoir multi-species fishery as dictated by the management plan. And um, what we're trying to do is respect the management plan in terms of the priority for wild trout management within the river. Um, that's a different management goal than what is for the reservoir. So that, that's really what we're trying to do here is, is respect the plan for both the river and, and the reservoir. One more question on the amendment to this. So the proposal was, or the current is 10, one over 15, a proposal of five with potentially five over 15. What was the amendment? We don't have an amendment. If we do, we have nothing on the table. So it would stay at 10, 10 one over, one over 15 yes. right now. And the only way it goes to what's been proposed is somebody makes a motion to change it. Yeah. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Commissioner Tabor. Uh, can I ask you uh, what your thinking was in your compromise uh, suggested language? What what led you to that conclusion and, and what kinds of things you were thinking of and why you thought that might be a, a good compromise? Sure. So I talked to, uh, I just want to make it clear, it was out of my head as a compromise. It wasn't anything that anybody asked me to do, but I did speak to um, fisheries and I did speak to Trout Unlimited, uh, a couple members, and I listened to their meeting in Townsend. And where I came to increase, because if if accurate and over 50, they're all over 15, then it is a one, one fish take. And so my compromise was instead of taking five, three is the middle of the road. And that's where I, I came to it. And really with, a, and it's not, it's not supported <laughs> by, I'm not sure it's supported by anybody who's gonna come up here and comment. It was just something that I wanted to see what uh, on paper, what it looked like, so. Well, what it strikes me of is, is, is kind of, a, you know, like so, so many of our decisions, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And, and at least this moves the ball a little bit forward in terms of what the department does, but not as aggressively as what folks are, are overreacting to. And, um, and I, I feel like that's very responsible. So I'd like to make a motion. I, I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the fishing regulations from Tostin Dam downstream to Highway 287 Bridge north of Townsend for walleye. Uh, 10 daily, three over 15 inches possession is twice the daily limit. Is there a second? No second. Okay. Motion dies for a lack of second. All right. Any other questions before I go out to comments? All right, so the comments that we'll be taking are on the motion, which only covers the perch. There is no motion on the walleyes. The walleye would stay the same as it is in the regulations. So anyone who would like to comment on the motion? Okay, so the motion on the table is for the perch, change of regulation in the perch number. We didn't take any action on the walleyes, so the walleye would remain the same as it is currently. I'm Chair Robinson, Commissioners. Um, good morning. My name is Brian Nielsen. I'm the Council Chair for Montana Trout Limited, owner of Missouri River Guides in Craig, Montana. 
Um, I support the five fish plan developed by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and I urge you to do the same. Um, I urge you to trust the biologists and the science that made them arrive at their decision. Fish, Wildlife, and Bi Parks biologists up the chain of fisheries professionals have recommended the regulation change which you stand behind their work. Thank you. Well, if you guys want to comment, come on and on up. Commissioners, appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, the way I understand it, this is on the perch part of this. I have plenty of comments on the other side, but I'll hold up uh, to get us the cue. But in regards to the perch and the perch number, this is uh, uh, <clears throat> an issue that really I'm looking at historically what's happened. I guess overall, I would like to encourage the department and the biologists. I've seen this happen. I've been around for a long, long time, fishing the perch and the walleye and the trout. But um, let's be careful with this boom bust cycle on these perch. Um, it's like there's a crash, there's no perch. Gosh, we got perch go to 50 a day. If you've ever been on Holter Lake on the north end in the wintertime when there's 300 people out there, you can't park. The reality of it is that fishery, that fishing is going on, there's 30 to 50 feet of water. You can catch, literally, I've taken my girls, they're grown adults now and they're kids. When you start bringing those fish up at 30 to 50 feet of water, you're killing every fish, whether you let it go or not. Um, I look for the department to lead the public in the baseline, let's conserve. Nobody needs 100 fish to kill 100 fish a day for any reason. Even if the biology was there, let's let the other game fish in the system eat those walleye and solve some of the concerns that we're talking about these fishery and the, the forage base. So just as a general rule, um, I'm not really against this perch limit. It's, it's a reasonable uh, move, but it concerns me that it's moving back in it because it used to be 50 a day. I think it was two days limit. To get 200 keeper perch, I would watch, you know, tons and tons of people killing two or 300 perch a day even though they're letting them go with their eyes bulged out because they're bringing them up from the deep. So it is a wasteful, gluttonous thing to witness. I, I got to the point where my little girls didn't want to go out there. Anymore. These little, their dead ones laying around. It, it, it's not a real pretty thing. And I just don't think that the, the department obviously should be aware of that and encourage conservation. There's a lot more of us around here. There's more people moving in. There's less, you know, less supply here. So I've just, just as a general rule, in that direction, not on that particular uh, change in thing, don't let it go too far. Right. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you for your time. Okay, so I'm just going to double check with legal since we've made no change to the truck to the walleye. Yeah, then we're not taking comment on the walleye. Okay. Sure. Right. Madam Chair, I'd like to take an opportunity also. Please state your name, your city, and organization and you're representing this applicable. <clears throat> Additionally, there's a two minute on that. If, if could you state your name? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm Jim Muskett. I'm in town of Montana. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, come on up. Perch. Perch, yes. My name is Matt Zito. I live, my uh, last name is spelled Z E A D O W. I live on County Ferry Towns, and I've, I've spoken to a few of you. Um, the Holter part, I was out there last Saturday. I talked to Jason Rohan as well, one while we stopped out there last Saturday and literally from the dam to Bog Gulch, I don't know if any of you guys know how far that is, probably about a mile section. There was two to 300 people fishing that section for perch. There were everywhere, everywhere. My concern is that you gotta be careful with what guys are doing is they're catching one, they'll reel it up and that perch will be that big. And they'll go, oh, that's not big enough. And they throw that one back and then they try to get one that's that big. So that kills that little one. So if you do put this limit change in, which I'm not totally against, I'd say you put a put a uh, catch and keep. So you catch that perch, and if it's that big, it's yours. You can't you can't throw it back because it, it won't go back. They're floating all over on top of the ice underneath. The, they come up and they float up and they're dead on it. You got to go out and see it. So you catch them, you keep. That's the way it is. And the perch over there that we caught, just so you guys are aware of it, are we had nothing over nine inches and we had, there were about six to nine inches. And I got the best electronics to find them. So we were aware of it. <laughs> we cut a lot of holes. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Okay, Cameron Nisel, N-I-C-D-I-L. I'm from Townsend, Montana. I agree with Matt. 
And if you do a catch limit in that regard, so you would take different gear classes of fish out instead of someone targeting a, you know, a, the big fish that they're trying to do and then releasing the small ones and they die anyway. So you wouldn't be killing just one generation of fish either, maybe the spawners for that year, or potentially next year. And like this comment earlier, you get rid of a lot of the boom busts in that lake. I've seen the same thing. Some years you can go out there and catch a hundred fish in an hour, then they up the limits. And then the population change. So it's kind of my opinion. If you did that, you have to keep everything you catch there because they're essentially all dying. I've been out there before and just see dead fish all over the ice because people don't want to play a fish. Maybe they'll stop keeping as much or be smarter about it and stop wasting a resource that we have. Any other comments? Yeah, I Madam Chair, members of the Commission, for the record, Clayton Elliott, E L O I O T T. I'm standing up. I, I recognize our, our council chair spoke already, but uh, Dr. Bias with the Fishing Outfitters Association of Montana wanted to associate um, himself and, and foam with the comments. Um, and with all due respect to your legal counsel, I would suggest that the lack of motion is in itself an action on walleye. Uh, we would encourage you to make a motion and to adopt the, the agency's recommendation and support the biological decision making on this on this body of water. So um, I apologize to, to disagree a little bit, but the, the lack of action is an action in and of itself. So we would encourage the department's recommendation to move forward with five fish in this section. Um, and like I said, foam wanted to appreciate themselves with that comment as well. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, is there anyone online? No. Okay. All right, any questions before I go to a vote? Just one more yep, question. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, the, uh, we had a lot of discussion about walleye and managing for walleye, but as far as the perch go, what the, the rationale for the increase of limit, is that to drive the perch populations down or what would be the reason for doubling the limits? Or Chair Robinson, members of the commission, uh, Commissioner Burroughs, I, I mentioned that at the beginning, which seems like a little long time ago now, but. Just to reiterate, the management plan direction for perch in Holter is for eight to 12 yellow perch per net. Um, we are currently at, I think it's about 38 perch per net. Um, so under that, what the management plan says is to liberalize the harvest in order to provide more opportunity. Um, so just to clarify, because some of the comments might have gotten a little confusing, we are not proposing to change the daily limit on perch. What we're proposing is to keep the daily limit at 25 with the possession limit at 50. So I just wanted to be clear on that because there was a lot of numbers get, getting thrown around. And so it's 25, currently it's 25, daily 25 in possession. The proposal is to go 25, 50 in possession. So hopefully that helps. Sir Rosen, Dr. Rice, can you please comment on the uh, recommendation that this the rank be changed to uh, no catch and release on, on perch? Yeah. Key, I think yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, Chair Robinson, um, commissioners, Commissioner Walsh, you, you've heard us talk about that before in other situations. Uh, a mandatory kill regulation, we call it. We typically use those in the place of um, illegal introductions, invasive fish. Um, but certainly if, if that's something you want us to address, um, the way we would write that in the regulations is um, 25 fish daily um, mandatory catch and kill. And then that would require if regardless of, you basically wouldn't be able to upgrade in size. So whether it was a five inch perch or a 12 inch perch, the perch is part of your limit, so. Uh, Dr. Sure. Rice, I just asked that you consider that the, in the new management plan. Uh, I think Chair, it was well argued today that that's an issue. The regulations. So Chair Robinson, Commissioner Walsh, just to be clear, the upper Missouri management plan is not currently getting revised. Okay. So it is um, that regulation change would fall under the upper Missouri management plan. Um, 
So I, I would I would put it on the commission if that's something you want to propose. I would say it falls within the structure of the plan as it's currently written. That plan's not up for review for another couple of years. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it, it doesn't have to be in the plan. It just can be in the renewal of the regulations when we redo the Ex regulations. Exactly. I just wanted to make it clear yeah, since you mentioned you. the plan. Any other questions? All right. So the motion, and it's the perch motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. opposed, same. Okay. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Fish removal projects, please. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, um, two items left, and then um, you'll be done with me. Um, <laughs> The next item is, is again, one that you've heard from us previously, um, but just for the benefit of the new commissioners to give a little bit of background. So we've been bringing fish removal projects to the commission for approval for, I think, the last couple of years. We've been doing it on an, an annual basis. We're moving now to a four-year cycle, so as it ties up with our, our new statewide management plan that you've heard reference to. So what we talk about when we mention a removal project, um, it's, it's anything that involves taking a fish out of that current population and either moving it somewhere else or, um, or killing them. So in some situations, it's mechanical removal. Um, the most typical mechanical removal would be where we would use electrofishing and a cutthroat restoration population to basically spot remove um, brook trout or other competing species with their native species. Um, the, the other Typical removal project is the use of a um, piscicide, which is a chemical that targets fish, targets scale breathing um, organisms. Um, and the, the purposes, and then we also use netting too sometimes, but those electrofishing and piscicide use are our typical ones. The reasons we do this, um, as I've mentioned, to reduce competition, remove undesirable or invasive species. Um, the typical example there would be, you know, last year we did a couple of goldfish ponds that were illegally stocked. Um, we go in, we clean out the pond of the invasive species. Um, to protect species of elevated conservation, those are typically West Slope and Yellowstone cutthroat projects. And to improve the quality of a uh, sport fishery, Sometimes we will purposely remove fish from a population in order to improve the fishery. Um, sometimes we have to remove, you know, smaller fish just to, to make a more desirable fishery. So in front of you today, you have um, the fish removal projects um, from 2023 through 2026. There are 26 in total. Your approval today allows us to move forward with the planning of those projects and also to um, start the MEPA analysis. So each one of these individual projects will go through um, their own individual EA with extensive public comment. So even although these projects are listed out for you by name, by water body, you're not approving them to go ahead tomorrow. You're approving us to start the planning. Um, and then there'll be extensive public process. So with that, um, during the public comment period, we received 31 comments. There were seven opposed. Some of the comments you'll read that talk about um, our reporting on the success of projects. Um, that's something we're working on. We do keep a database of all of these projects um, and several of the projects we do report on 
um, as an individual based on their funding, but we are going to um, do a better job at a comprehensive database following up. Um, oftentimes, these projects need, you know, five or 10 years to evaluate their success. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And we do have staff available if there's any questions on a specific project. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I would entertain a motion if someone would like to make a motion. Madam Chair, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the fish removal project proposed for 2023 to 2026. Motion. Okay, motion by Commissioner Lay and second by Commissioner Burroughs. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we go out to the public? Okay, I just want to remind the uh, regional offices too, if you have someone there, just make sure you turn your video on and, and if I miss you, just speak up so I know. Uh, is there anyone present? Good morning again, Madam Chair, members of the commission. I promise this is the last time I'll uh, remove myself to uh, be in the, the Capitol building across the street. But Clayton Elliott, ELL, IFTT, representing Montana Trout Unlimited, want to stand in support of the, the proposed fish removal projects for this season. Uh, many of you know that this is a new process relatively uh, to bring these proposals in front of the commission. I think uh, that has been working well. Uh, looking through the list of projects, I think you see a broad suite of responsible uh, recovery restoration work that is being done by the department. Uh, I would just underscore, as Dr. Rice mentioned, that most and all of these projects will then once again go through a robust public comment process where local folks, uh, interested parties have an ample opportunity to provide their input into that planning process. Uh, so we are not uh, missing any opportunity for communities to have a say in, in this work. But taking these as a suite, I think it's a responsible part of the work of the department to help recover and focus on uh, native fish restoration. In many cases, what we're actually doing is helping keeping species from becoming federally listed, um, for example, as well as recovering uh, really uh, important economically viable uh, sport fisheries. So uh, once again, because of the roads, I would offer support for Fishing Outfitters Association of Montana and Dr. Bias uh, for, for this suite of projects and thank you for your consideration. Okay. Thank you. Any other commenters? Is there anyone online? Uh, Madam Chair, at this time there's no one online unless there's an agreement. Okay. All right. The, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We'll do this next one and then we'll take a little break. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, I'll make this as quick as possible. Um, I'm actually presenting this on behalf of both the fisheries division and the wildlife division. Um, this is uh, another one of those recurring items you'll see from us every other year. It's a process to approve the fishing and bird hunting regulations according to the co cooperative agreement between the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and the state on the Flathead Indian Reservation. There are no changes proposed to the previous regulations um, and the new regulations will span from March 1, 2023 through February 20. February 28, 2024. With that, I take any questions. Questions? Madam Chair, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the 2023 to 2024 Flathead Indian Reservation number for fishing and hunting regulations as presented and subject to final tribe council approval. Thank you, Commissioner Burroughs. Second, anyone? Second. <laughs> Commissioner Walsh. Is there anyone uh, present who would like to comment? Madam Chair, one commissioners. My name is Jeff Lucas, L-U-K-A-S. I represent the uh, Montana Wildlife Federation. I live in Missoula, Montana. MWF recognizes that non-members of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes are guests. Uh, or, I'm sorry, that non-members are guests on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes reservation 
and we are very grateful for their generosity in allowing such high quality hunting and fishing opportunities on our land. M MWF supports the commissioner's approval of the 2023-2024 CSKP non-member fishing and hunting regs as presented and subject to final tribal council. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Do we have any commenters online? Um, yeah, Chair, unless we have any of the regions. I did see that the region board joined a little bit later on a meeting. So if, if any of the regions have any public comment, go ahead and turn on your camera or on mute. Questions or comments before we go to a vote? Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, we will take, uh, let's just take like a 10 minute break. Well, let's just do 10 30. We'll come back at 10 30. <clears throat>
All right, we're back on reconvene the meeting. Uh, Mr. Shank, if you want to go ahead and start, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. My name is Bill Schenk. That's S-C-H-E-N-K. I am the Land and Water Program Manager uh, for the department. Uh, I have five items on the agenda this morning. I visited with the chair during the break and uh, uh, we've decided that uh, we would take the first two items together, followed by the third, and then lump together the last two items on this list. Uh, so the first item on the agenda is a, a fee acquisition at um, 501 Pemberton Lane in Billings. This is just uh, a stone's throw from the existing Billings office there on Lake Elmo. Um, this is uh, something the region is very interested in. They are simply um, overflowing of their existing parking and um, you know, for trailers and for employee vehicles and storage. Um, the lot is 2.4 acres. It's been on the open market, and um, they um, and and so the region is very interested in this as part of the package here. Uh, though it's not, you know, your decision this morning is whether to pursue the the uh, the uh, acquisition of the lot itself. But uh, they are packaging together a sort of a series of actions that would. Um, upon acquisition of the lot would also include um, installing a sidewalk uh, in front of that lot, installing a sidewalk in front of Pemberton Lane, or not, I'm sorry, the existing office itself, uh, an enhanced delivery space um, for the office, um, fencing and lighting at the new facility or the new lot with uh, some potential for further development down the road. At this time, it would not include uh, development for employee housing or for by trailer parking for employees, but that could uh, occur uh, in the future. Um, the appraised value, we would pay the appraised value of the lot at $290,000 and there's an additional $5,200 in diligence costs. The total price of the package that we're talking about in terms of with the build out is uh, $515,200. Again, it's acquisition of a 2.4 acre lot. Uh, there's been an environmental assessment and public comment period with really no uh, public comment to the, to the in opposition. Questions? Go ahead and go to the next one and then we'll take comments. Okay. The second item, Madam Chair and Commissioners, is the Otter Creek Island LL or Otter Creek LLS Islands. The Otter Creek Ranch is just upstream from uh, it is just upstream from Reed Point, Montana. Um, this would be an expansion of the Indian, the existing Indian Fork fishing access site on the Yellowstone River. Uh, these are two parcels totaling 107 acres as surveyed. Um, we would buy, we would purchase the existing parcels, though they have been eroded, they've been accreted. So the, the actual uh, footprint of these has changed some over time. Um, this project came to us via the Natural Resource Damage Program that uh, is proposed, proposing to pay for the entire project $140,150, that's the appraised price of these two parcels. Um, the funds for these uh, come from the, uh, the settlement with Exxon Company over the Silver Tip Pipeline spill. Uh, there was an EA published on September 28th. Um, public comment was generally supportive. We had one public comment, uh, which raised questions over access and indeed, the access is boat in only, but it is in um, close proximation to the existing fishing access site, really right across the river. And there's also another fishing access site about four miles to the river. So 
the region thinks it will get public use and will be uh, accessible by boat and, and fairly easily accessible at that. Um, there was a concern over the, uh, the purchase price, but again, that was done with an appraisal and that's, uh, we, would pro we would pay that appraised price. Uh, I will just mention, I know that uh, he can come up, but Doug Martin with the Natural Resource Damage Program is here to answer questions from their programmatic. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Shank, I'm not familiar with this, um, these specific islands, but are they suitable for camping? Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner Walsh, I, I believe so. I mean, of course, um, you know, most of, almost all of the land on these two is within the 100 year floodplain. So at high water, no. But at other times of the year, um, I, I believe they would be. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I would entertain a motion on first the Pemberton Lane acquisition. Madam Chair. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I'll just, I'll just speak to Pemberton Lane uh, being from Region 5. And, and as Mr. Shank mentioned, we are definitely bursting at the seams out there. And this is this is very heavily supported by the region. So with that, I'd like to move that the Fish Wildlife Commission approve FWP's acquisition of 501 Pemberton Lane in Billings. Okay, Commissioner Lane has seconded it. <clears throat> All right. Is there uh, someone who would like to make a motion on the Otter Creek? Islands. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. I, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission authorize FWP to acquire the two parcels known as the Otter Creek LLC Island Parcel and expand Indian Fork fishing access site using funds from the Natural Resource Damage Program. Second. Commissioner Burrow seconded. Okay. Any questions or comments before I go out to public comment? Is there anyone here who would like to comment on either either one? Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, my name is Jeff Lucas, L-U-K-A-S with the Montana Wildlife Federation. Uh, got comments on both? Sure, go That's ahead. Okay. Sure. So for uh, Pemberton Lane, uh, MWF supports uh, this purchase as it will improve crowded conditions at the R5 headquarters at a reasonable price to the taxpayer. So we urge you to pass on that. Uh, for the Otter Creek, uh, MWF uh, strongly supports this, uh, uh, the department acquiring this property. Uh, the purchase adds public access opportunity and conserves important riparian habitat. And this purchase also honors the wishes of the landowner, uh, preserving land that supports natural river functions while providing public access. Uh, we urge a few pats on this. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission, I'm Doug Martin, member of the Montana Natural Resource Damage Program. Um, I'm here to uh, lend our support for this program uh, or this project, the Otter Creek project, fits very well into our restoration plan that we had for the settlement uh, with the ex or post uh, the Exxon uh, oil spill on the old zone in 2011. And this plan was approved by the trustee, and uh, we do appreciate your support. Okay, thank you. Anyone else present who would like to comment? Is there anyone in the regional offices? Anyone online? Any questions or comments before I go to a vote? Okay. We'll start with the Pemberton Lane acquisition. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, the next one is the Otter Creek uh, LLS Islands expansion. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next item is the uh, Ruby Dam Fishing Access Site Lease Agreement. Uh, 
This lease is with the uh, Projects Bureau of the DNRC. Uh, it has, we've had it under lease, we had it under lease for many years um, at no cost to FWP. Uh, we manage the recreation at a popular site, uh, basically for DNRC. Uh, it expired in August of 22, and so we had to go through a renewal process, including this uh, approval by the commission. The, uh, the lease also, though, would uh, change slightly. Um, the only change in that lease would be to uh, allow at some future date uh, some development of a, 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 a limited camping opportunity. Right now, it's a day use site, and um, so on our environmental analysis, we did not analyze exactly what that camping opportunity would look like or the development. We did do an EA, actually the DNRC for their ability to lease this to us, did an EA over the summer, uh, beginning in July. They received no comment. FWP took that EA, adopted it, re-released it uh, sometime later for uh, 15 days and also received no comment. Uh, so it's this is basically a keep it like it has been uh, arrangement and um, we would renew this lease for 10 years. Questions? Commissioner uh, Brooke? Uh, thank you, Chair Robinson. Um, about how many acres is it? I didn't see it on here. Oh. Chair Robinson, uh, Commissioner Brooke, I, I don't know the answer to that. My understanding, though, I've seen the map, and so just putting a mental picture is that it's limited to, you know, maybe less than 10 acres. Um, it sits right below uh, the Ruby Dam, so it includes an access road from a county road into it. We do maintain that road and gives enough space for the public to, to utilize that route, that tail water just a bit. I don't think it's a particularly large site. Follow-up questions. So, um, so would there be room for camping? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Brooke. Yes, indeed. I mean, it, it's contemplating some, it's not an extensive, not a large, uh, you know, highly developed campground. Uh, my understanding there is the region's contemplating at some point in the future, some primitive camping opportunity. Uh, oh. She's saying seven acres? 7.7 okay. acres. Thank you. Hope. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Entertain a motion. I will make a motion that the Fish and Wildlife Commission authorize Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to approve the recreational lease with the DNRC for the Ruby Dam FAS. Uh, Commissioner Lane seconding. Okay, any other questions? Is there anyone present who would like to comment? Glad we're getting familiar with each other today. <laughs> uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Commissioners, my name is Jeffrey Lucas, LUKAS, I uh, represent Montana Wildlife Federation. Uh, MWF supports this purchase, it's an easy one. Uh, as it will improve crowded conditions at the uh, farm stations, uh, as, as it will maintain access to a crucial fishing access site in Southwest Montana that's used by Montanans, people from all over the country. Losing this access site would just uh, further concentrate people in areas that we already have access to. So we urge you to uh, keep this Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Is there anyone in the regional offices? Okay. Just a reminder to the regional offices, if you do, just turn your video on so I know. Um, is there anyone with their hand raised? Okay. All those, any further questions before I go over? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, um, we're going to do the last two items together, um, though they're a bit different. They both involve conservation easements. Uh, the first of which is Bear Creek Angus Conservation Easement okay. Restatement. Could I, could I make a recommendation that we take them separately? Just because I may, I may introduce myself. 
Okay, yes, I forgot about that. So we'll do them separately. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, so the Bear Creek Angus Conservation Easement Restatement. Uh, this is in effect an amendment to an existing conservation easement. Just by way of background, it's something that we do occasionally. Um, this one is um, mostly to correct uh, errors in legal descriptions or something like that. Uh, this one's a little bit unique in that in all my time here, I've not seen us actually shrink the size of a conservation easement. And this one would do that. Um, but it is, again, it's a really unique situation. The owner of this, and this conservation easement was originated in 1994, but it, it included the provision for splits of the land. So we have four owners out there on that original conservation easement. This particular owner has 768 acres. And on that 768, there are four building envelopes. Three of them have houses on them. One of them does not. And they have a total size of 40 acres within that, that larger easement uh, that are eligible to be, to be built and to be developed. Uh, the owner would like to remove one. It's an existing home. And he came to us with a proposal to excise that one that home in one acre out of this conservation easement and in exchange offered to give up one building envelope in its entirety which is five acres and is right up against um, our bear creek wildlife Ranch, and then shrink two other building envelopes uh, to bring the total um, effective net gain to over 23 acres for this conservation easement. again it's not a uh, a procedure we undertake very often, particularly shrink the size of one. But in this particular case, with the with the sacrifice of the building envelope, um, it was it was well thought of proposal and seemed to be a conservation gain. Um, we did publish an EA on October 17th. We ran that for 21 days. We received no comment. We did have contact with the Madison County Planning Department, and they expressed no concerns. Questions? I did ask, uh, there is a Popat County Road, did you say, or that accesses the one acre that they want to remove? So it does have access? And Chair Robinson, that's that's correct. It sits right on uh, County Road. I would entertain a motion. I'm going to petition the Game Commission to approve the Bear Creek Angus Oslo Portion Conservation Restatement as proposed. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Brook and seconded by Commissioner Walsh. Is there anyone present who would like to comment? Yes, there is. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, I am Jeff Lucas, L-U-K-A-S, uh, representing Montana Wildlife Federation. Uh, Montana Wildlife uh, Federation supports this conservation easement restatement as proposed. Uh, very simply, it's good for public access, it's good for wildlife uh, habitat, and it ensures uh, ownership of means in Bear Creek Angus Ranch. So that considered, we urge it to pass on this. Thank you. And any further comments? Any public comments? All right. So all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the last item on that I have for you this morning is uh, acquisition the Sweathouse Creek Conservation Easement purchase. That would be an acquisition of a new conservation easement. This easement is located on the, the land belonging to the Hackett <coughs> family, 540 acres in the Bitterroot Valley west of Victor. Um, in Ravalli County. Um, the land sits right at the mouth of Sweat House, the Sweathouse Creek Canyon. Uh, there is a trail there that the public used, has used for many, many years. Uh, and the family has allowed that access without any formal easement over the ground. It accesses the Forest Service Trail that goes up to the falls and all the way up Sweathouse Creek. This family has also been very, very generous with public access on this piece of ground for many, many years. It's been in block management for, for 25 years. 
They've also allowed other seasonal access in summer, and uh, it really has been sort of integrated into the, the recreational landscape of that area. Uh, so we've been working both the department and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and uh, significantly the Bitterroot Land Trust has been working with this family for probably five years to get to this point. Um, they are they're very dedicated to the project uh, and uh, would allow recreational access on the easement, not only for hunting, but throughout the year. The project also has very high conservation values. There's winter range for deer and elk, and given the elevational mix of the land and the fact that there's riparian habitat as well as other sort of ecotypes there, uh, very diverse <clears throat> species assemblage there. There's 38 species of conservation concern on the property. Uh, the appraised value here is 3.38 million. The purchase price is 3.08 million, meaning the family is, to, is prepared to donate $300,000 value. Funding would come from Habitat Montana and from Pittman Robertson funds, but also there's a number of other um, entities that are contributing here. Um, the open space bond fund has been approved, expenditure of open space bond funds has been approved by the Ravalli County Commission. Uh, the uh, Montana Fish and Wildlife Con Conservation Trust will donate funds to this purchase. Uh, and, and again, I think that the, uh, the Bitterroot Land Trust has, uh, has raised other funds for the, for the acquisition. There's been an EA, it was October 5th, it was published and there was a public hearing in, um, I think in Victor in, on October 24th. Uh, we've received no negative comments on the property or on the acquisition. Madam Chair. For the record, in my duties as a county commissioner, I supported the project and supported the authorization of the county open land bond funds for the project. Um, after discussion with council, there is the potential that there's a conflict of interest there, so I'll refuse myself to vote. Are there any questions? I would entertain a motion. I move that the Fish Wildlife Commission approve the Fish Wildlife and Parks purchase of the Sweathouse Creek Conservation Easement as proposed. So, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Brooks. Motion, Commissioner Lane, second. Is there anyone present who would like to comment? Madam Chair, welcome to commissioners. My name is Jeff Lucas, LUKAS, representing Montana Wildlife Federation again. Uh, MWF supports uh, the approval of FWP's purchase of the Sweathouse Creek Conservation Easement uh, due to the property's high value wildlife habitat for numerous game and non-game species. Uh, also its accessibility for the public and as well as its overwhelming local support. Uh, MWF's local affiliate in the Bitterroot uh, Valley County uh, Fish and Wildlife Association worked extensively on this project. And anyone who spends time in the Bitterroot knows this land would easily be subdivided if it's not entered into a conservation easement. This would cause a massive loss of uh, important and crucial habitat, including wintering ground for deer and elk, and public land access. Uh, this is a great usage of Habitat Montana funds and others, and, and it respects the wishes of the Hackett family in perpetuity. So based on those considerations, we urge the commission to approve this purchase. Any other comments? Region two, do you guys have comments? If no, if there's no further comments. Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Spread cows. Is it hot in here? Yeah. I think we could 
do both of them and then uh, separate motions and then go out for comments. Good morning. For the record, I'm Hope Stockwell, the administrator of the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division here at Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And I have the next two agenda items in front of you. The first is the proposal to close the Fresno Tailwater Fishing Access Site during the duration of a Bureau of Reclamation Safety of Dams project being conducted there. This was actually requested of us by the POR. The region occurs. Uh, during the project, there's going to be heavy use of the FAS and the access road, both to store and haul materials and equipment, and we're just concerned about public safety. So we propose this to you. I do want to make a clarification. The original cover sheet that came out said that the reservoir would be dewatered during the project. That's not true. That was a misstatement on our part. They're dewatering the tow, but the reservoir itself might be lowered, but won't be dewatered. Just for clarification, that was one of the comments you received. Um, but we do recommend closure of the site for public safety. And what we'd look to do, though the project is scheduled to start this spring and run potentially to the end of October of 2025, uh, we close for the duration of that prep time or until it's safe for the public to return. So we'd look to be flexible based on what's actually happening with activities at the site. Sure. I would, I'll would entertain a motion before we move to the next. Uh, Madam Chair, I move the Fish Wildlife Commission authorize FWP to close the Fresno Tailwater FAS during the Bureau of Reclamation Safety and the Dams Project on Fresno Reservoir for the duration of the project or until it is safe for the public to re entry. So I'll second that. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Burrow, seconded by Commissioner Lane. Okay, go ahead with the next. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair and members, the second item is a renewal of the Wildlife Management Area Public Use Rules. Uh, this is another example, and for the new members, I'll just give you a little history here. Under the reorganization of the department, we've been looking to improve consistency and efficiency in all of our processes. We've aligned more visitor management, recreation use management under the Parks and Recreation Division. And as part of that, we're looking to bring forward a consolidated set of public use rules for all of our lands and site types. Uh, as we work toward that consolidation, we've been bringing forward renewals of the existing public rule packages uh, just to keep them in place during this time. We do expect to bring the consolidated package to you later this year for consideration. But this is the latest one where we're asking for a renewal. In the meantime, the proposed seasonal rules, they comprise uh, winter range seasonal closures, allowances for camping on WMAs, off-road vehicle use, firewood collection, and other public use activities. We did receive 10 individual comments uh, during the pre-commission process. And I would suggest that we would take those comments. There were some specific rule suggestions in there and we would take those and incorporate those in our process of consideration for the consolidated package. Questions? I just, uh, I remember one of the comments was regarding the use of drones. And I would encourage you to review that very closely. I don't think, I guess my, my thought towards that is, is I don't think we can, or I don't feel like we should restrict the use of them as long as they are not uh, harassing wildlife. I just don't know, I obviously can't answer this, but I don't know what legal precedent we would be setting by doing that as far as trying to restrict it where I mean you cannot restrict the use of airplanes in the area. So just just a recommendation. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Siegel. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Stockwell, just a quick question. One of our comments uh, related to a question that I had, which was uh, the, the the typical rule of wildlife management areas don't, don't open until May 15th. I think that's kind of typical in the spring. And I guess there was a, a request or suggestion that, that we could move more wildlife management areas to an earlier opening to be able to take in spring bear. And I was curious, uh, is that something you're gonna be considering in, in the comments uh, for the for the overall plan? I would be interested in that as well. We'll certainly take that under advisement. And I appreciate knowing commissioner that that's a particular one for you that you'd like us to look at. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioner sure. Burroughs? Is that the rationale for the, the exceptions? Um, like maybe specifically Calf Creek and the Bitterroot that WMA opens April 15th 
why why is that first the may 15th mr chair or pardon me madam chair and commissioner burrows i can't speak to the cap creek instance specifically i don't know if mr temple can um i would have to look into that for you if that's why that one's specifically like that these are set based on site specific conditions and considerations okay Any other questions, Commissioner Lane? No, I, just, I, uh, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the WMA public use rules for the 2023 calendar year as proposed. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Commissioner Lane and second by Commissioner Brook. All right. Is there anyone present who would like to comment on either one of these? So. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, uh, Jeffrey Lucas from Montana Wildlife Federation, LUKAS. Uh, Montana Wildlife Federation supports FWP's adoption of the seasonal rules as proposed. These rules have effectively managed public use uh, and not adopting them could lead to degradation of fish and wildlife habitats in these areas. Therefore, we urge the Commission to approve WMA use rules for the 2023 calendar as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay. Do we have any public comments? No. Okay. Not at this time. Okay. Reaching forward, do you have comments or okay? All those in favor, we'll start out with the closure of Fresno. All those in favor, signify, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then the WMA public use rules. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. with enforcement now thank you madam chair members of the commission my name is bill kilbreth i'm here today proudly representing the law enforcement committee of fish wildlife and parks a couple of uh items for you first up on the agenda we had a presenting the church slew working group recommendation by way of background for the new commissioners um regulating the recreational use and our chief legal is going to talk to this a little bit more in the uh, when we get to the petitions. But just in general, the commission has authority to regulate recreational use of surface waters in uh, the state of Montana, and they do that through, at least with respect to voting restrictions, through the administrative rulemaking process. So all of our voting restrictions live in administrative rule. In the administrative rules, any member of the public is uh, able to submit a petition to alter, change, remove, whatnot, these kind of voting rules, the administrative rules. So this petition or this recommendation here is the result of a petition we see the department received or the commission received to limit church slew to no wake zone, to a no wake zone on the water body. So in response to that, the commission directed the department to uh, create a working group with local citizens, interested persons to discuss the petition and perhaps generate a recommendation based on what the petition says. So the department recruited a 11 member working group that represented a variety of different perspectives and backgrounds. Uh, the working group met two times in August last summer on the 2nd and the 18th and discussed possible voting restrictions. This group ultimately voted to uh, recommend the commission to adopt a 200 foot no wake zone in church slough, prohibit wake surfing or wake boarding in the slough, and require personal watercraft to operate at a minimum operational speed or no wake speed, depending on the particulars of the watercraft. Um, we did do this process with the work group. The public was invited to participate in the work group. We did get some participation in that. Uh, we haven't collected any public comment on this, which depending on what the commission does could potentially happen today or down the road of this rulemaking. Um, so when the department or the enforcement division looks at a uh, voting restriction, we look at it from the point of view of, is there any sort of documented safety issues? 
that the petition seeks to address? Are there any natural resource issues? And then how enforceable is it consistent with our existing voting recommendation regulation? So with respect to this, while we certainly very much appreciate the efforts of the uh, working group, we do not have a documented existing safety issue. We don't have any documented voting accidents in church slew. The department has not identified any resource damage as a result of voting in the slew. And uh, we don't feel that the regulations would be consistent with our statewide regulations. And we feel from our enforcement point of view, they may be difficult to enforce. So the department does not recommend the, uh, the commission move forward with rulemaking. Uh, with that, I'll stand for any questions. Sir, with two new commissioners, would you mind just kind of talking about this? this? Sure. So it's going to come up again later too, but with respect to petitions, they come from the petitioners. We think we talked about this in our orientation. They come from the petitioners. FWP doesn't have a stake, a position on them. FWP is not bringing any real petition forward, but at the request of the commissioners, FWP did this working group. So that's why we have two sort of different um, positions here. One is the petitioner who asked for the rulemaking, and one of the departments who has their opinion has given at the request of the commission. But under normal circumstances, absent that request from the commission, you wouldn't have our opinion. So your decision space here is you can uh, grant the petition, begin the rulemaking process. If that happens, then uh, rule language, proposed rule language will be drafted either by the petitioner, by FWP or in conjunction. And then it will go out for public comment, go through the entire map process, then it will come back to you as a rulemaking, final rulemaking action at that point, and you can have all the public comments and uh, consider it whether to adopt the rule or not at that, at that point. Or you can deny the petition today, at which point there'll be no other action. And, or you can modify the petition and initiate rulemaking, or um, put, again, like you did, put it out for some additional information. But sorry, the, on the last point, you can only do that at the um, discretion of the petitioner. The petitioner agrees that the petitioner is entitled to a response in a certain amount of time, and they've given us an extension essentially to get this done. So if the petitioner requests a decision today, they're entitled to that. If, they, if we need to put it out for more information, then you can do that on there. Commissioner Tabor, see your hands up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is in our region and I've spent quite a bit of time conferring with the region one management enforcement. And um, I wanna start off by thanking the, the committee that got together and, and the service. Um, I think on a lot of these, what, what we're finding is it, it really helps to get a lot of different perspectives and in particular, the people that are really gonna be impacted by any proposal. Um, one of the things that I learned in the process, and, and I really appreciate um, the sergeant getting up there and describing the lens in which the department looks at it. And I, I want to reiterate that there's really, you know, in terms of the, the confines of our authority and what we're really trying to accomplish, it has to stay within the lanes of what, what our responsibilities really are. And in this case, you know, are there any safety concerns? Um, you know, is there any natural resource damage and is, is whatever proposal actually enforceable? And unfortunately, despite the, the good efforts of the committee, um, this proposal doesn't check any one of those boxes. And, and that's one of the reasons why the department really can't support it. So for that reason, um, I'm not gonna recommend any action that the commission take at this time. And, um, and if the original petitioners then as a result of that wanna to try to repartition, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously go through the process that was just uh, outlined by council. The one thing that I would ask uh, both of enforcement and um, deputy um, director uh, Temple is there's a total of seven slews that are up there uh, as tributaries off the river and I, I wanna say that anywhere from 10 to 12 years ago, they did a first rulemaking on one of the slews and that still stays somewhat intact. Each one of them has different characteristics. And the concern that I have in watching all these individual 
water body petitions keep coming up is that we're going to wind up having 25 different regulatory schemes for each individual body of water based on each individual set of constituents that's trying to control a certain outcome instead of having a state system, which in fact we already have relative to no wake zones and those types of things. So what in talking to region one enforcement and, and uh, leadership, um, they do like the idea of, of possibly going into a study period of trying to decide whether it would be appropriate to come up with a uniform uh, enforcement strategy for all the sloughs uh, that are tributary to the Flathead River um, so that we don't keep doing these one-off assessments. And then, because uh, I think if you're a boater and you enter in anywhere on the Flathead River, you know, you're going to wind up having to have an artificial intelligence guide tell you which regulations are in effect, depending on what body of water you happen to move in and out of. And I think I distinctively remember the director saying that one of the things we ought to strive for is consistency across the state in all our regulatory uh, efforts, you know, unless there is a particular set of circumstance that calls for uh, a, a difference. So I would ask the department to queue that up as a project. And I would ask the commission to uh, support me in, in taking no action at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Commissioner Tabor, that is not, that's not a, one of our options. We can either deny it or we can ask for further information if they agree to it, but uh, our, those are our options. Okay, I, I said, I thought I'm reading here from the cover sheet, no motion required if the commission chooses not to adopt. Did I misread that? That's the final sentence on the cover are sheet. You on the, are you on the church slew one? Yeah. It's on the bottom of page one. I have a different, apparently I have a different one. <laughs> so our options are the commission may deny the petition or initiate rulemaking as presented with adjustments or we may instruct the department to conduct additional scoping. Those are our options. Okay. Um, I think you're reading the cover sheet and I asked to have that was, yeah, that was supposed to, that, I'm sorry, that was supposed to have been changed. It's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, the, I, if I may, Commissioner, mm -hmm. the um, Commissioner Tabor, what I just heard you say would, um, translate into a denial of this petition that's in front of you. And then the commission can choose to either initiate rulemaking on its own for the larger project or to direct the department to um, do some sort of scoping for that. Or you could have a, another petition or you could wait for another petitioner to come in and ask for that petition. If, if I'm translating what you said into a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Councillor, thank thank you for that. I, so I, I believe my motion is to deny the petition. I'll second. I'll second. I have a, I, okay. I'll take uh, Commissioner Tabor as a, making the motion and Commissioner Siebel for the second. Any questions from the commission? Do we have anyone present who would like to comment? Madam Chair, before we take public comment, I just want to clarify with uh, Council, is there a secondary motion that I need to make relative to remanding the department to start in on the examination of a consistent set of, of a regulatory scheme for the SLUs? Um, does that require a motion or is that just something that we can ask the department to queue up or I'm looking for guidance? Yeah. Commissioners, they, um, you don't have to initiate rulemaking at this time. That's the only thing that would require an actual motion. So a direction okay. to the department. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Madam Chair, Vice Chair Tabor, you, you have our commitment to initiate that process. 
Thank you, Deputy. Okay. All answers. Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners, my name is Jeff Lucas with the Montana Wildlife Federation, LUKAS. Uh, MWF supports the Church Slough Working Group recommendation as it will prevent shoreline erosion and improve wildlife and fish habitat by leaving shorelines undisturbed uh, by motorized water, watercraft wakes. We urge the commission to initiate rulemaking on this working group's recommendations and not deny this petition. Thank you. Any further commenters? Go ahead. Dan Simonson, S I M O N S O N. So, this subject is kind of a heated thing, and it's going to continue to become more and more forefront because the wake surfing industry is here to stay. It's a great sport. A lot of people can participate in doing it. But bigger is better, bigger waves are better waves. And the technology in the boats is, is starting to show that we are only going to see an increase in the size of the waves. I would argue that erosion is a factor in natural resource conservation that does align with fish and game. When the shorelines eroded, you lose the riparian zone, which is one of the most essential habitats around any kind of water body. Erosion is the after effect. What's happening, why the erosion is starting is because we're losing plant life, vegetation. Plant life and vegetation is responsible for breaking waves and interfacing the land and the water. If we lose the vegetation in the woody trees, that kind of stuff, then we lose our natural buffer for erosion. So erosion has been caused by us losing that already. That's, that's already happened. The other thing is these boats have do their angle, the prop wash is significant sediment and phosphorus in the water, potential for algae boom, blooms, all of this could be detrimental to fish and wildlife as well. Um, I have talked to a game warden in region one about uh, enforcement on this stuff and it is tricky. All enforcement is tricky because I understand you have to be able to come to the court and say yes, you can do this or not. There is a safety concern. I know you don't have a lot of documented cases yet, but due to the angle of these boats, you can't see in front of you very well. You can't see other boaters that kind of stuff very easily. So I, I don't think that you quite looking at it um, as thoroughly as we could. And there's a lot more education that I can provide because I'm the fully five. Okay. Thank you. And with a, with a direction too, though, it's not. I mean, just if we do deny this, we are also gonna make look a bigger picture of everything too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I understand it. And I actually didn't have any other reports some ideas from other places that are doing that. Sorry, are there any other comments? Is there anyone online? We do have one hand up. Okay. Brad Rowley. Okay. Yes, this is Brad Freilich again with the Water Sports Industry Association. Um, we too urge uh, the denial of this, this proposal. Um, we tend to follow the recommendations of NASBA, the National Association of Boating Law Administrators. That is the organization that's made up of all of the uh, marine enforcement entities across the, the country. And we take a cue from them in regard to their towed water sports. Uh, recommendations. Um, our organization represents all towed water sports, so tubing, water skiing, wake surfing, wakeboarding, and even parasailing. And their recommendation is that um, on waterways you have a 200 foot buffer. We absolutely support that, but we believe that that 200 foot buffer um, is enough to mitigate the wave from a wake boat. So um, there, is, there have been numerous studies on wake boat waves and wave attenuations. They all uh, have pretty much the same data, and there is a formula that uh, can be extrapolated from that. Um, when you're talking about a wake boat, 
the wake boat will lose one half of the height of its wake in the first hundred feet. In the next hundred feet, it will lose another 20% of its height. And then every hundred feet after that, it loses between three and 4%. So if you have a wake boat on, let's say, Church uh, Slough, and it creates a 30-inch wake at 100 feet from that boat, that um, wake is going to be down to 15 inches. And at 200 feet from that boat, it is going to be down to a basically a swell that is nine inches high. We believe that that's not something that would not naturally occur on that lake. And we think that that's a reasonable standard. So we urge that um, you, you um, deny this petition. Thank, thank you. you and thank you for your patience for the agenda <laughs> item to come up. No problem. All right. Any other are there any other commenters? You can only comment once on yes. this. Commissioner Tabor. I just wanted to emphasize because I know this is a sensitive issue, and again, again I want to thank and appreciate and acknowledge the effort that both the department and all the citizens put into this. Um, it's a much bigger issue, and, and Madam Chair, you stated it correctly. Rather than just focus on one, let let's get to a totality of a solution for the whole area and perhaps the state, because um, as as uh, Lee Anderson, who's the uh, director of Region 1, put it, uh, if you just go buy all the boat shops right now, uh, there's no shortage of new wake boats coming into play. Uh, you know, this is a very hot item in the market. More and more people are drawn to do it for, for recreation. So, you know, this, I don't know how, when they were introduced, but it could have been what, you know, 10 years ago, you didn't see them very often. Now you're seeing them everywhere you go. So it's an issue. And it's not an issue we want to ignore. I just think we need to do it in totality and in a uniform statewide basis rather than do one-off prescriptions everywhere we go because it'll be too hard to manage. So I appreciate the comments of the folks that, that still support doing something. Commissioner Walsh? Yeah, just a quick uh, question for uh, Mr. Kilgrave. The As I recall in the Latin's original petition, they did provide uh, photographic evidence of bank erosion in this slew. Is that true? And then it's saying now that the department has seen no, no evidence of uh, erosion. Chair Robinson, Commissioner Walsh, the, the department looks, we might look at erosion if it was causing some kind of a natural resources damage in a sense, but we don't typically monitor erosion as just straight erosion. We look, when I, so when I reference natural resources, I'm talking about waterfowl, fisheries, things like that. We don't keep track of how much erosion is actually occurring on an individual uh, water body. And when we talked about this particular one, our biologists did not, uh, in region one, did not uh, recognize boating usage as a uh, source of natural resource damage. So erosion, I think what I was told before, erosion is not really within our purview. It's that's not what you're looking at. It's it, Madam Chair, well, erosion it, itself is yes. correct. Erosion itself is not something the department looks at in of itself. We don't monitor erosion. We don't keep track of erosion from boats, from storms, from ice, from other things. It, it, we might look at it as an issue if it had some sort of a resource component to it. Um, we had a fisheries person here that might be better to answer that question, but in general, we don't monitor erosion. Any further questions? Go ahead. Just one other, Madam Chair, and that is, it uh, looks like you've brought some reports for us. Do you want to no. distribute those? I think he's he's I'm, a speaker later. I'm with oh, the Lake five okay. one, but it's very parallel. And then be, and this will all be pertinent. Okay. okay. Thank you. I didn't realize that. Madam Chair. Uh, I, I don't know who it could answer this question, but how wide is this slough? A thousand feet. A thousand feet. Follow up question. So, if you have a two hundred foot wake zone, can they still they still wake for a tree there? Yeah. So it, the the two hundred foot idea is is great if you have if everybody can stay two hundred feet away from each other, but that gets eaten up pretty fast and 
thousand foot thing. And then if you take 200 feet off each side, you're dealing with a 600 foot center that you're going to have, you know, in, a, in July, I don't know how many bullets, <laughs> a lot, uh, potentially. So it's not really possible. That's what I, you know, I'm trying to show is that, and I'm, I'm with you guys. I don't, I don't really want to piece make everything. It's just, that's the process right now that everybody's been instructed to do if, you know, you talk to the fishing game or whatever, like, well, this is what you have to do. Okay. So, so is, I just want to make clear that he, he is not making his two minute comment. We can ask questions, but I, I mean, just to be aware of that. Yeah, I'm not making, I'm just, I'm just trying to help you understand that, that this is a, this is a big deal. And it does make sense to ask these questions because when you have, imagine, you know, you get a couple of boats in there, what are they going to do, right? They're going to have to come with both of these women. Any further questions? Double check and make sure nobody's. Can I say one other little thing just to, that, that goes with the 200 thing? All of the science is showing that the boats need fiber. It's kind of what seems to be more space. All right, not seeing any further comments. Any more questions from the mission? Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I just want to just want to comment that that I I second and I support uh, Vice Chair Tabor's motion because uh, as we've seen, you know, I was I was a big proponent of the public involvement in in the when we had the proposed rule on the Boulder River. We came to a compromise. There were safety concerns there uh, with regards to fishermen and, and boaters because it is a small river. In this case, and, and why I supported uh, Vice Chair Tabor's motion is that you know, and we can see even from our agenda today, there's there's lots of people who are who are, are concerned about their their waterways and, and boating, and whether this is an erosion issue, whether this is a, a habitat issue and a fishing issue, or whether it's a property value issue. I think this is something that needs to be addressed on a wider scale so that we don't uh, you know we don't have this happening. Lake by lake or slough by slough across the state. So that's why I supported the and seconded the motion. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Tabor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I I would also have one more ask of the department and, and perhaps specific of either enforcement or legal. And that is um, you know, where where our responsibility begins and ends relative to to property damage, because a lot of times folks that are coming to us are saying, look, my my property, my personal property is getting damaged as a result of this. And I, and I, I certainly sympathize with that. It, you know, it would be frustrating if you bought property and it just keeps. But I, I, I have a feeling and I, I believe from a legal perspective that that isn't really within our authority to take that into consideration. It, it feels like our authority is strictly relegated to, you know, the safety issues and the protection of, of the resources that comes to fish and game. And so um, I don't know where the remedy is, you know, relative to if, if you have some real major conflict on waterways and it's causing a lot of personal property damage, where one might turn to for that. But I don't feel as if maybe it is within the purview of our commission and less it, it impacts safety and health and welfare and and then also you know its impact on fish and game so since we know we're going to get more of these and we already have some it would be great to get some additional legal clarification from the department of enforcement so we really know the parameters of our of our authority thank you commissioner Siebel. Just, I, yeah, um, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I would just add that uh, the, I think the fisheries department really should look at this bank erosion issue. I've personally spent a small fortune preparing banks on the river that runs through our ranch. And, uh, you know, I uh, would argue that that is very much a FWP and commission topic. And um, I fully support Commissioner Tabor's idea that we should be looking at this holistically throughout the system but i i uh, i personally would support the work of the work group in this case all right 
All those in favor of the motion to deny signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay. So that is Commissioner Walsh and Commissioner Brooke voting against. Motion carries. Okay. Go ahead. Chair, members, Commission, switching gears to a uh, topic that's almost, I would say, the polar opposite of the one we just dealt with. Uh, in my role in enforcement, I also handle uh, some of our commercial wildlife program. And within commercial wildlife comes um, species classification and possession of uh, wildlife. So a little bit of background on this petition as well, or, or this process as well. In statute, there is a, a series of laws that deal with possession of wildlife. And to, to summarize it essentially wildlife can be divided up into controlled species which you can have with a permit prohibited species which you can only have if you're a zoo or some licensed scientific facility or non-controlled species which are species that can be owned and traded in the pet industry or person can own them and so it sort of represents a series of controls to you know, non-controlled to controlled to prohibited in it represents an increase in the amount of uh, regulation and controls on wildlife that people can have. To arrive at these classifications, the legislature has established a classification review committee. It is sort of a uh, committee that's made up of uh, people from a variety of different backgrounds, members of the department, veterinarians from the Department of Livestock, people from the pet trade, interested citizens make up this group and they analyze requests to have a species classified and then they make a recommendation on what classification if any of the species should have it and that is brought to the commission. So this particular item started as a petition that the classification review committee received to classify caracal cats as a non-controlled species. And so the classification review committee analyzed the petition and generated the response that we we being the classification review committee, not the department, recommended that they be a prohibited species. The department brought that to the commission and uh, the commission elected to do a public comment process on that. So they initiated rulemaking. At the conclusion of that, the commission decided to do a table the prohibited species or vote not to adopt and then directed the department or initiated rulemaking to do it for a controlled species. So this petition represents the conclusion of that controlled species or this item is the conclusion of that uh, process. So the department after the commission meeting where they initiated rulemaking on controlled species, the department ran a 30 day public comment period uh, that started on November 4th, 2022 uh, and concluded on December 1st. During that process, we received no public comments in writing over the phone. And we also held a comment hearing where we received no public comments on that. Uh, so no comments on this proposal to make it a uh, controlled species. So today as such, the, the commission can choose to adopt a rule which would make a caracal cat a controlled species or the commission can choose not to do that in which case it would remain exotic wildlife and would not be able to be possessed by a person. This is a very complicated subject to try to cover in a uh, quick presentation, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions if anybody has any. Uh, Commissioner Tabor. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the proposed amendment to ARM 12.6.220A classifying Caracol cat as a controlled species. Um, I remember this one well. It was perhaps myself and. and have a sec let, let me get a second first. Oh, sorry. Second. second. Yep. I'll second. Okay. Mr. Sorry, Madam okay. Chair. Yep. I remember this well. This is, I think, uh, Commissioner Seaball is in mind, one of our first things to tackle when we first came on the commission. And we went through a lot of understanding how rule changes and all that work. But at the end of the day, we went through the process to really understand how to both protect. Uh, you know, wildlife in general in, in Montana, but also afford somebody an opportunity that essentially exists with a like kind species. And it was just an inconsistently applied um, 
policy. So in doing this, we're applying the same basic policy we've had for like kind type species. Um, the department has a substantial amount of control over this to help protect the rest of the wildlife in the state. And for that reason, I encourage the rest of the commissioners to support this motion. Is there anyone um, present who would like to speak to this issue? Anyone online? Just double checking with the regional offices. for any questions okay all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. all opposed same sign motion carried okay we're going to do the financials real quick have you guys had a chance to look them over madam chair i move to approve the expense report okay second commissioner lane and commissioner burrows any questions about the expenses? Okay. All those in favor of the approval of the expenses signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. I think, I think that we, what do we have planned for lunch? It is here, but it's on the floor. So. Okay, because I think what I'd like okay. this one is not all right. Okay, so you only have two, two. Okay, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up everything before lunch, and then everybody can just eat lunch before we leave. So we'll just push through, and um, the next on the agenda will be Lake Five, and then do everything. I'm sure I can um. Chair, I can just reiterate what I've said for all of these petitions. Um, you have those, those same three options. And just I just told the chair this, but we heard on the Bitterroot and Clark Fork petition, we heard from the petitioner yesterday, and he has a very bad case of COVID. And so he won't be here. And he couldn't, he wasn't even feeling up to being online. So he's asked to move that to the next commission oh. meeting. So that'll come in. April. Yes. And so we only have the two, the Lake Five and the motorized bitter petition um, in front of you. And the same options apply to these, which are you can accept the petition and initiate rulemaking. You can deny the petition with the petitioner's uh, agreement. You can extend out to get more information. But if the petitioner doesn't agree, then you have to make one of the two proceed decisions. And then I don't know what the cover sheet looks like for sure, but look at the chair agenda and that will give you the, um, your options. And we don't have to repeat the cover sheet because they're not Okay, got it. We don't have a cover sheet, right? Look at the chair agenda, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My chair agenda looks different than yours. Yeah. So I have Lake Five and then Bitterroot Clark Ford petition. Yeah. And there's, there's another one after that. I, I could we, could you please? Last one? Lindsay, would you mind printing out a new chair agenda for everyone, please? Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll through your presentation. I'm going to give you 15 minutes for a uh, presentation on the Lake Five. I've, I've kind of made agreement with planning for 20, but I didn't try to do it for 15. All right. Um, <clears throat> take anybody's time unnecessarily. This is some extra information, compilations, actually, photographs, that kind of thing. This is actually a study from the Department of Natural Resources in Michigan, fisheries, might be helpful. We can have somebody else hand that out so you're not taking all your time to uh, hand okay. that stuff out. Well, either that or I can just talk as I'm doing it, but it doesn't matter to me. Thank um, so the one thing about like five that's a little bit unique as far as in the context of not wanting a bunch of single little regulations on separate bodies of water and everybody trying to keep track of what this lake's doing, what that's like doing. Lake five is unique in that it already actually has done that. 
It is the only lake in the state that I know of over 30 acres that does not have a no wake zone. And it also is the only lake in the state that does not allow personal watercraft jet skis whatsoever. That was done right at the time that the Paul's Memorial Fishing Access was put in to help with public safety and impact of the access going on at the lake. Um, again, I guess I just, I feel like after talking to the invasive species biologist that comes to lake every season, a couple times a year, he's adamant. Water clarity equals water health. So I, I really think uh, Walsh, Mr. Walsh has a, there's something in his intuition right now pointing towards that. Uh, there is probably a way to connect fish and game into water clarity, water quality, because I don't know of a more valuable natural resource, quite honestly, than water. I'm not sure of any life form that can live without it. Um, And I was, I'd like to go through the report with you guys. Um, we were going to try to screen share and do all that. Okay, so Lake 5 is interesting and unique also because it is in the West Glacier Scenic Corridor. It is literally has millions of people driving, you know, not necessarily directly by it, but on the highway that goes by it every year to go see Glacier National Park. Um, there is a ton of people who don't actually have a boat and are just trying to paddleboard or swim, kayak, camp, and presence of the boats, gosh, there's just so much going on. Let's stay with it. And so this is this is kind of showing Lake Five. It's really about, it's similar in Church Slough. It's about a thousand feet uh, across at its widest points, um, besides where like the island is, but it's really shallow there. This is an old chart on this map from 1991. So I, I I know it's really outdated, but it's interesting that it's already looking at prop washing and you have data and evidence on, on boating impacts before wake surfing. My wife's great grandfather homesteaded Lake Five. He took over Deep Falls in 1915. Her family has been, her, her great grandfather started the business in 1922. It's 100 years old last year. Where are the fourth generation, our daughters are the fifth generation up there. There's legacy of family fun, family camping. It is a truly magical spot. Motorboats started on Lake Five in the 1940s, 1950s, and it became a, a pretty big water ski boat destination. It's been skied on and enjoyed by boating enthusiasts for decades. It was never very noticeable on the effects of Lake Five and what was happening to the water until you have you know, some pictures of, of water skiing in history. Until you have 1990s is where tubing and kneeboarding and trick water skiing and then wakes, wake boarding comes into play. And this completely changes it because boats were trying to be the smallest wake possible to putting a big fat sack underneath the seat and trying to up the size of the wake, slow down your speed, Plowing a little bit. Nobody thinks otherwise. It's everybody's having a great time. It's awesome. Boating has trended into bigger and better, bigger waves. I did the calculations on this Malibu M240 with just 100 pounds per person on the 17 people that it can hold and the 86 gallons of gas and the weight. And I got 14,222 pounds. <laughs> so I think there's appropriate places for these boats and there's really questionable places for these boats. 14,000 pounds is that's a lot of displacement. That's a lot of power. What the gentleman was talking about in the, the, with the industry stuff is he's talking about wave height. Wave height is very deceiving because 
power and intensity of waves directly changes with wave height. And that's the part you're not necessarily seeing. So, you know, when you're just measuring height, it's not necessarily as accurate as intensity, of course. Here is a prototype of a 35 foot new age wake surf boat that is being developed to have a 10 foot barrel wave swell. Awesome, right? Probably not so much on some of our lakes. Maybe could be done on Flathead. That's where the industry is going. Wake boats are unique. They are designed to create a huge wake. They ride an angle that puts their prop towards the bottom of the lake and they are monsters of horsepower. They have a lot to push. You know, it takes a lot of force to be able to push seven or 14,000 pounds around the lake. So the issues with them, environmental, which Fish and Game is debating on whether that is a thing. Public safety, again, another debate. Invasive species, I don't believe that's so much a debate. Um, and impact on wildlife. There is, after this Michigan report that I gave you, I highlighted a few parts off of it. Um, interesting research that they found on zebra mussels in particular, which I know we deal with in Montana, the density of them. Uh, I, I won't read into it because I question the time. Some of the stuff that I really hope you guys could come through and just re-review. Another thing just real quick I did kind of point out on the riprap which is going to be something that we're going to see more and more people trying to do we even had people suggesting to to the lake shoreline around like five but this does just doesn't give the waves a chance to diminish at the shore and they wind up rebounding back into the lake so you don't actually help the problem and make it worse that's something that church slew has been looking at and church slew is going to move towards engineering the banks with riprap and doing that they did talk about those many things so that will be you know something to consider. The, the conclusion stuff in these studies that I have cited here is all pointing towards, there's no way to, to, to not have boat waves. Boat waves are inevitable. The only thing we can really do about it is change the distances that we're practicing with these boat waves. And wake surf boats need more space. Uh, the 200 foot Mark was developed during the days of ski boats. This was a total different era of boating. So all of the science I can find, and there is a lot of information coming out, even from the time when we wrote this study of this petition in September till now, it is just incredible how much more information you can find and start connecting dots with. But all of this, I'm trying to recircle back to like five. And so, it seems to me and to a lot of people that one of the smallest sectors of recreationalists being wake surfing, wakeboarding, is causing some of the greatest impact on public waters. Maybe we can rebalance. I think everybody's in agreement of that. You know, one thing to consider that we already have a unique ruling on Lake Five, perhaps even maybe a place to start some experimental seeing on what works for regulation, what doesn't, something to consider. Like I said, Lake Five does not have a no wake zone. I'm on this page with the map now. Um, we did you know, a lot of work with Google Earth and getting our measurements and created a shaded zone to show what 200 feet would be like. And then we also did a shaded zone showing what 500 feet is on the lake. And there's essentially three teeny little strips in the middle that do not even connect that would give you a safe distance of 500 feet for waves to dissipate before they hit the shore. We actually have a video, it's not going to be played, but it is showing a boat who is surfing responsibly. They are out in the middle of the lake, but even with 500 feet, you can still see the severity of the impact on the shoreline. Um, and then that same shore we have you know, numerous photographs of in this report. We did have a loon nest documented at Lake Five. We always have loon nesting at Lake Five. The environmental assessment, when they put Paul Memorial in, couldn't find loon nests, they admitted later on, oh, we never looked, thought to look on the island, <laughs> which is where they actually the preferred nest from what I understand. So there was a miss there, but um, a lot of people are concerned about loons. This, I did try to erase this line here, common loons are not endangered. Um, 
And I did write down there, so I apologize about that. This was another video just showing another part of the shore where, where waves are hitting, you can't get it to play. Uh, and then we go into a series of, of photos, just looking at some of the erosion, some of the bank, the changes that have happened in the last 10 years. Uh, was a trail along the shore. It's, it's essentially gone on our shoreline, it doesn't exist anymore. But what's in its place is uprooted trees and undercut bank, and, uh, lots of dirt and sediments that gets kicked up every time the waves come now. It's just, it's just kind of a, it's a snowball effect, as you could say. These are just more pictures of, of the shoreline, trying to get some examples. So the, the ruling, the idea that I had was in conclusion was we have a, there's a, so many people that are interested in doing other sports, other types of recreating with the water. If we split the season and we had part of the season, no way, part of the season boating, we would allow for actually more shared use, probably a, a little bit more even uh, fairness to all the different sectors. It would also diminish the impact on the lake. It would allow for maybe a little bit of vegetation to regrow giving half of the growing season. It's not having waves. Uh, the, the surf boat stuff, it's just everything we're seeing. I mean, I, I don't really want to really like to say no to anybody, but bodies of water like Lake Five and Church Slough that are a thousand feet wide, they just don't have enough space. And we didn't even get into the depth stuff, but like I have just got no depth. It does show it on the map there. There is some, some doc, uh, just diagrams kind of showing prop and depth. Um, this is this slide here. I'm jumping ahead because I know we're out of time. I will allow them to ask, um, excuse me, questions when you're finished. Thank you. Also. So this is this is one idea that um, really Vermont's trying to utilize. And in, in this picture, you have a lake kind of like Lake Firewood Church. So it's just not wide enough. It's not quite big enough. This picture, you have a much larger lake and they can make a wake sports zone in the center of the lake. And they use a parameter that has to be at least 60 acres in the center, a thousand feet from shore. And this gives another separate area in the lake for people to have space before the waves are hitting the shore. There's really no other way to, to, to lessen the impact and is just to move them a little further away from the shore. Okay, so this, is, this is illustrating just what I was talking about, the angle of the boat, water clarity, phosphorus, suspension, and quite possibly affecting what I consider to be our most valuable natural resource in the world. Uh, this is a little bit of a simplified map. This is actually the map of Lake 5. And I just put that old horsepower death deal on here because even that study there, it's a, man, it's a long time ago and we were already looking at the impact of prop wash on the bottoms of lakes. But it's out of sight, out of mind, so easy. Are there any questions from the commission? Oh, Mr. Walsh. Yeah. Well, so I have one question for you. And that's uh, uh, how many wake boats are there on Lake Five right now? Um, old summer day. As far as homeowners and guests of homeowners, um, I think we're dealing with probably eight. And as far as people launching at the public fishing access, which that's another whole subject, that fishing access basically funding. Nobody wants to fish on the lake when people are serving them, quite honestly. But that is, I don't know, that's, it, it, there are days where there's four, five, six wake surf boats all out at the same time and somebody trying to intertube and people trying to paddleboard and it, it's a small lake. Yeah. I think people maybe consider it, there is a, a safety concern. Fish and game deemed there was a safety concern long ago with personal watercraft. Uh, I can't see how that would be different now, um, but, I don't know the exacts, but I have That's many times seen multiple surf boats at the same Thank time. You.
The one thing that I have thought about a lot because I have talked with a few different fish and marine representatives about where the what what regulation is the fish and game responsible for? What are the things that is deemed your territory, so to speak? And that's a lot of why I actually printed off that fisheries report. And this is similar in all of the petitions that I'm seeing from other states is that they're not actually working with fish and game and, and this is just where Montana is at right now, but they're all of them pretty much have found laws and are citing laws that are in like questionable violation just by the sake of, of wake surfing. And so I wonder if Montana already has some laws for our water and protection and natural resources, quality, all that kind of thing that we're just kind of missing in that legal black and white. Um, way that things like this function. Are there any other questions from any fishers? Commissioner Tabor, I know you had a um, an amendment. Yeah, I I wanted to provide all the opportunity the petitioner had before you know I go into my comments and in my motion. Um, so just want to make sure everybody's got their questions out of, out of the way before I make my motion. Um, I think we have one more question. I guess I'll proceed then. Um, <clears throat> I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission take no action at this time on the petition for Lake 5, no wake writing. And I move that the department form a citizens advisory group with the same design features of recently done with Church SLU tasking the group to develop recommendations for potential administrative rules regarding Lake 5 motorized restrictions. And so my understanding is for that, to, for us to be able to look at that, then the petitioner, you would have to agree with that motion. Right. And my alternative is, is that it goes, it dies, it either dies or we do work in group, right? Kind of, it's, it's a confusing, uh, process. <laughs> you can grant the petition. Oh, we can grant the petition. Yes, we could grant the petition. Yeah, uh, we can do a working group. That's fine. I think um, it's really relevant for the whole state. And I, I do think that we're looking at this stuff big picture. It would make a lot more sense to just even for the sake of helping wake surfing. <laughs> it's kind of like wolf management, you know, everybody's really upset about it. But the only way to ensure that well, wolves get to stay here actually is by managing it, right? That's kind of probably the same. Is there a second? To I, I second. Okay. And one, Madam Chair, one thing I'd like to make clear is is um, this this isn't a recommendation to actually look at the bigger, broader solution in the sloughs. This this really is specific to Lake Five. I actually have a a very strong understanding of Lake Five. I've been there several times. I have friends that have legacy properties there. Um, like other areas, though, it is remarkable the divergence of interest and opinions. Um, it's a unique community, and I'm sure our, our speaker can, can um, comment to that effect. And so I just want to make sure that everybody's thoughts and feelings are, are taken into account. Um, and that if there are solutions, that they're mutually developed solutions instead of having a solution and it's either up or down boat. That's that's the benefit of having a working group. There may be, you know, there's a there's solution A in front of us, but there may be solutions B and C that that might ultimately be better for the resource, better for the homeowners. I don't know. The one thing I will comment on, and I I deferred not making any comment during my region one presentation. Um, the commissioners know that they've seen a lot of comments relative to the fact that there's an EA right out right now relative to the donation of a fishing access site. And uh, the department is taking a pretty serious look at it. And, you know, in talking to uh, the regional director, Lee Anderson, you know, it's, it's not lost on the department up there that we are talking about a resource that is 
really loved <laughs> and really used heavily, not only by all the extant homeowners and those legacy families, um, but by virtue of the resort that's there, the public access. Um, when you get right down to it, if, if you know that area in the glacier, uh, gateway to glacier, it's one of the few quickly accessed lakes where you can have a little recreation if you're not going into the park and you don't want to make the drive all the way up to the reservoir. So it, it, it's, it's for a lot of the people that live up and down that corridor, it's a great place to take a quick swim or take some kids and everything else. And then we've, of course, got the boaters and, and everybody else. So this is a very, very high use, very small body of water that that requires a lot of care and, and consideration by all the citizens that want to use it. And so it seems ripe for a conversation for the people that are directly affected as well as people that use it and see what they come up with in terms of ideas that, uh, and the one thing I would encourage both the department and the, and I'm sure you'll be one of the participants on that committee, but but anybody else that gets on that committee is, do look for, for the, the avenues of the boxes we need to check, you know, so, you know, you have been going down the line relative to resource protection as it equates to the protection of the fisheries and water quality. Um, I think the safety concerns are, are potentially a real issue here because of the smallness and the, just the sheer volume of vehicles. I know I, know I was taking my grandson out on a paddleboard um, and uh, it was a little precarious trying to get across a certain stretch with all the different crosswakes and everything else. Um, so uh, it, it's a unique environment. I think it requires a citizen's approach to say, how do we really want to manage this resource and make it as welcoming for everybody as we possibly can? Because I don't think one recreation type of user, whether it's a paddleboard, trumps another one. And that's the problem that we're having here is competing values of how people like to recreate. And, and you know, we're plopped right in the middle of this trying to figure out, okay, well, you love to wakeboard, you love to paddleboard, here's a kayaker, here's a water skier, and, and we, got, we got to get them all to coexist on one little body of water. So it feels right to lend it to that, and I hope you don't see this as a setback. It's just a much more thorough process that means you're going to probably get to the best answer you possibly can, and that's why I'm proposing it. Yeah, no, I understand, and I appreciate not having the direct target just on my back. This is just Dan Simonson who presents the work. It, it, it's pretty overwhelming to try to take this, these, fill these shoes right now. I, I honestly would rather just go out there and surf myself and not deal with any of it, but I, I do have this overwhelming, looming feeling all the time that we are. <laughs> And that's my only concern with, with doing the working group is that it's just, it's another season of, of the same debauchery over there. The, it's kind of like dominoes. I mean, as soon as that shore is scarred, it's kind of, I mean, it like 10 years of it, 20 years of it, whatever. I don't know how you get it back even by, you know, with the best solution, but I'm only intensifying it. So thank you. So I would ask you, Mackenzie, you have the slideshow and video and everything. I do, yeah. So I will have her send it to us. Thank you. And then if they're in the future, it's very helpful for us to have that ahead of time so that we can go through it. Yeah, I can explain actually. Yeah. Quentin, um, I found Tabber's comment to rule for working committee um, the thing, and I had never been notified about it. And I called Quentin, and he was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I should have told you. And so we actually reworked. I, I had a learned a better understanding of where the fishing game is coming from. And I, I really reworked, I, I, okay. re, I okay. re authored it. And then I did actually send it to Clinton. He was supposed to relay it. Okay. The ball got dropped. Also, I will say this, I would love it if the other person on this petition is Lindsay Bennett. She wasn't even able to do this by Zoom because she was, we were told by Clinton where the link was on the site. We were told that we would be sent a link. We also had a, two other members that were trying to be in on this. And okay. we just literally just got dropped on this. So if I went and drove down in the middle of the night last night, went to Staples this morning, and, uh, you know, I mean, well, and that's why you. I was late. I felt <laughs> sure. horrible about coming. I'm just kind of exploring in here. I apologize about my presence. And we, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Okay. And like, we yeah. will, I mean, we'll get it sent to us and we can. Is there uh, any way that over. the other people that were going to 
you know, have a little something? Could we send it to her and she could yes. send oh, forward yes. it or that kind yes. of thing? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. That's awesome. Thank you. Is there any other questions, guys? I'm, I've done so much research on this lately. I'm pretty saturated. Uh, sure. Just a comment. Thank you for the presentation and for the state of Michigan fisheries report. I really appreciate it. And I think we can make sure that uh, Dr. Rice gets a copy of this. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, well, thank you for all the effort that you've put into this. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, we'll keep working on it. It's all good. All right. Anyone present who would like to comment? <laughs> You're fine. Um, Brian Larson. Here in Allen, we have a place not on the water but at Lake Five. <clears throat> we recreated at their resort for 31 years, and we've seen some change in the water, the erosion a little bit. But there was before surf boats, we had ski boats. There's been erosion, period, with all of that. But um, I understand it. I just go and seems like it's going too far too fast as far as original plan i think when he first put his uh proposal in it was based on loons and the production of them and it's moved uh, away from that as they found that the loons are or are not there to protect them but it's been a great place to recreate we i grew up there my kids of 13, 15, 17 have used the lake since babies. Um, we all paddleboard, surf, wakeboard, ski, tube, fish, kayak. And it's it's a great place, just like Jared Tabor said. Commissioner Tabor said. But anyways, it's some of the erosion isn't all from surf boats and boats and wind and we were out we were without power for two days because of the wind i mean it blows there the erosion's there um, but anyways i would like to say that i don't i don't i don't mind i'd be a part of the committee as far as we are willing to be a part of that but as far as rule making I you make sure that you left your uh, contact information and name with Mackenzie. And okay. I don't know how you how the, you put the committee together, but my recommendation is he made the uh, effort to come here, so it'd be a good idea to be part of the working group. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Any other comments? <clears throat> Yes, we have one. Okay. Mike. Okay. Mike, are you on there? Yes, I'm I'm okay. here. Can, can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Um, Adam Robinson, uh, members of the commission. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Mike Kapitsky, K-O-P-I-T-Z-K-E. I live at 1460 Grizzly Spur and own property right on Lake Five. In fact, uh, along with the Ridenauers, uh, my wife's family, Swanberg's, homesteaded in 1916 and owned 1,630 feet of lakeshore on that west side of the lake. And we happen to be also the closest property to the, to the loon nest. Um, yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm opposed to the rulemaking process at this time because, uh, again, nobody around the lake really knows what's what's going on with uh, with this uh, wake boat thing. We we found out um, due to an article in the Inner Lake, and so we need to, as uh, Mr. Larson stated, we need to slow down. Um, I listened to the uh, to the discussion on the uh, church slough and. And found that interesting that you're not taking their recommendations, which you know gives you a little bit of uh, wondering why we'd want to form a group here and possibly not have you take our recommendations. But I understand 
that your church slew is a, a lot different situation. I also really think that we need to take a look at the standards that are out there, uh, the laws and regulations that are out there, and make sure that we understand what those are, and under, and maybe those would take care of things. But we definitely need to involve those folks who have wake boats on the uh, lake. Uh, I'm fearful that this will become a no wake lake, which I'm adamantly opposed to. Um, I skied on this lake, my kids skied on this lake, my grandkids want to ski on that lake. And that's one thing I really want to avoid is a no wake lake on it. Um, you know, I look at the lake shore all the time and, you know, it's it's really hard to, and, and I've been up there for, for uh, 35 years, it's really hard to say exactly what damage conventional boats do versus the wake boats versus the, the tubers versus the skiers and that uh, have done on, on particular on our side of the lake where we're, we have some pretty steep banks that are pretty well rocked in because of where the railroad used to go. So I think we need more, more study, more research. We need to make sure that the decisions that we make meet the needs of the landowners on Lake Five. You know, we have a real major problem with your, the- your time, with the, your time is up. I appreciate your comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone in the regional offices? Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Good. Um, for the motorized venue position. Um, Craig, can you hear us? Hello. Okay, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, the commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to present this. I have a small petition here about the amendment of the AMRs about the motorized use in the Bitterroot. It changed it so that it would be during the summer. And it's, I think, Everybody can read, so you could just go down and see what it is. It would avoid interfering with fly fishing and those kind of activities. So this would be something that would be limited to times when it was not a prime fishing time. It would be a small, quiet watercraft. It would be limited in speed, and it would do no damage to the bottom of the stream bed. Just getting organized here. Sorry. <laughs> Does everyone have the petition in front of them? Okay. Okay. Um, petitioner James Proof. No, I don't. Okay. All right. Are there any questions to the petitioner? Madam Chair. Commissioner Sable, I mean, Commissioner Tabor, do you both have copies of it? It's it's in the uh, the drive. In the drive, yeah. <clears throat> okay, cool. Madam Chair, I just have. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a quick clarification question because I'm curious. I couldn't find what the current rules. I understand that this is actually a petition to allow some amount of motorized use. So I'm assuming. Uh, can you tell me what the current rules are on the bitter? Some from the department. Happened during October to January, so it's wintertime activity. Uh, so you have to be like a Navy SEAL or in condition as such uh, to go there. It's cold and wet. It'd be a 
uh, this would change it so that it would be in the summertime when the water flows were low and the temperatures were warm. Madam Chair, members of the commission, if you'd like, I can read you the administrative rule that contains the regulations okay. as they are. Okay, go ahead. It's for reference, it's uh, administrative rule 12.11.610 on the Bitterroot River. It says that the Bitterroot River is closed to the use of any motorized watercraft except any motorized watercraft powered by 20 horsepower or less are permitted from October 1st through January 31st from the headwaters of the Bitterroot River to the confluence of the Clark Fork River. And then an additional rule just for reference, floating of any kind, including the use of a two brass vessel or similar device is prohibited on Fridays from July 1st to September 15th from Canadrossville to Appleberry Fork Surf site. That's the entire administrative rule. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, before you step down, I had a question for you. I, I understand that this regulation or arm was put in place over 10 years ago uh, to accommodate waterfowl hunters. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Walsh, if you will uh, allow, I'd like to defer the question about the rule to Region 2 Regional Supervisor Randy Arnold. He is much more knowledgeable about why, how those rules came about or what they were intended to Randy Arnold on the line. Yeah, Madam Chair, Mr. Commissioner, Randy Arnold, Regional Supervisor in Region 2. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. So yes, there was a previous um, administrative rule process that went into place in 2011. And in 2011, there were a number of changes that had occurred to the Blackfoot River, Clark Fork River, and then in consideration was the Bitterroot River. And those came around the same time that Milltown Dam had been removed and some of the motorized activity that was previously allowed in the impounded water above Milltown Dam um, was really no longer available. And then increases in recreational things on the Clark Fork River, like um, the development of a play wave in the downtown of Missoula. So an advisory council was pulled together in 2011 and they came to some decisions around and made some recommendations for river recreation management to include the Bitterroot River, initially proposing to eliminate all motorized use on the Bitterroot River. But during that ne negotiation from that work group, identified um, an opportunity in the fall to maintain what had historically been occurring was some limited fall use for waterfowl hunting. And they proposed to maintain that 20 horsepower or less from October 1st to January 31st in that lower Bitterroot section. Any yeah, follow-up question, uh, uh, Mr. Arnold, is the, your perspective uh, that the current rules are effective and would you support or not support the, uh, the uh, petition that's before us? Well, Madam Chair, Commissioner, I, I think in front of you right now is certainly uh, this petitioner's request to consider additional motorized opportunity Rather than impart my own vision, I, I guess what I would describe is that it's currently working. Um, we don't have, we have very little to no conflict. We do see some motorized use in the fall by a few folks who choose to take advantage of that for waterfowl, but it's, it's quite limited. Um, and then, you know, I, I think rather than weigh into those waters, no pun intended, um, I think that's space for the commission to decide, um, but it's working now. Commissioner Burroughs. Uh, sure. Uh, very familiar with the stretch of river, floated it from basically painted rocks to past Missoula. It's not practical to have motorized use on the stretch of river. There are some, maybe some, some uh, relatively individual areas that you could maybe utilize some, some uh, motorized use there, but getting from like a designated point, launch point to those points, there's no way you could get there without probably getting out and dragging this vessel up through some of these riffle sections. Uh, there's no way you could guarantee a, operating a, one of these motorized uh, vessels would not disturb the stream bed. Uh, the the Bitter River is just not a big enough section of water to have uh, increased motorized use, in my opinion. Any other question? Oh, Commissioner Siebel? Uh, Madam Chair, I just 
Madam Chair, I'd just like to make a comment that, uh, you know, ha having supported, we, we had a lot of the same comments on the Boulder River in, in my region and having supported the, the the citizens work there to look at the, you know, a compromise that would 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 still allow for some motorized use. And it, it, even as impractical as it was, it's, it's practical at certain times. And there was a lot of discussion in our group and, and Sergeant Kilbreth can comment on this regarding, you know, electric kayaks and some of the things that, you know, Maybe maybe people would be crazy, but there are there are there's new technology. Certainly since 2011, when this petition was was uh, or the, the arm was adopted. So I guess my I'm sitting here contemplating. I understand what Commissioner Burroughs is saying, but curious, you know, if there's if there's other things other than you know, the, the the petitioners asking for smaller size here. But uh, my my recommendation is as always is going to be and is, is that we 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 take this out. It's a it's legitimate. I'm a I'm a multi use supporter. Of waterways, and, and if it's possible, and if it's if it's practical, uh, you know, given new technology, I would suggest that we have a uh, that we have uh, form a public group like we did in the past. I know I'm keep burdening the department with this with with forming these, but I think they're important. And, and I would even advocate, just as a side note, uh, that 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 almost become the the procedure for petitions, uh, especially. I mean, maybe the next step in a petition is it gets approved by the commission. And goes to that that um, the, the the public group to get to get all the stakeholders together. So, thank you. So, in order for that motion to be made or approved, the petitioner, Mr. Thomas, would have to approve us going out to a, a working group. Um, Madam Chair, may I make a comment? Yep. Uh, the comments about that you cannot navigate the stream. Uh, I have a hovercraft. I drive around in my hayfield if the grass is less than eight inches high, and it has a lift of six to ten inches. So I actually don't really touch the water or the rocks or the ripples. So that is a different kind of craft than what other people are maybe interested in but i would submit that the commission make the decision which is most appropriate for the largest population okay so would you be in agreement to us going out to a working group and coming back with some recommendations to us as as recommended yes ma'am okay all right thank you commissioner Walsh. Sure, robinson i i feel like this from all that i've uh Heard I've talked to David Brooks at Trout Unlimited, other parties. I'm also familiar with this stretch of water. Um, you know, I think that uh, I'm prepared to uh, make a motion right now to deny this petition. Is there a second to that? I would, I would second. Okay. We have a, a motion to deny Commissioner Walsh, seconded by Commissioner Burroughs. Any further? comments or questions, Commissioner Burroughs? I would just like to say, in my opinion, there's such little public support. I, I talked to this constituency there in, in Ravalli County and, and even in Missoula County. There is such little support. In my opinion, we would be uh, essentially wasting a working group in the department's time to go out there. There is not support for increased motorized use on the Bitterroot River and uh, I think you would hear pretty resoundingly that that's the way that the public feels there. Commissioner Tabor. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. I and I don't doubt what uh, Com Commissioner Burroughs is saying. I, I would suspect that's probably true in certain areas, depending on what ethics at work. I, I guess I'm I'm back where Commissioner Siebel was, not so much on this particular issue, but process in general, because. It feels very clunky the way we do this. I mean, right now, the noticing on a petition doesn't always necessarily grab the right people and their attention. We hear a lot of times, I didn't even know this was happening. I didn't have a chance, blah, blah, blah. And so um, then, then it makes you wonder, well, do we really have everybody's you know, voices heard before we make a fairly significant decision? So here, we can make the decision to close it down. That's fine. And then I imagine the petitioner could go back to the drawing board and try to figure out a different way to get it done if he's so compelled. And, and I imagine that's true of any petition. But I would be interested in, and, and I don't know if it requires a change of law or the MCA or whatever, that this petition thing seems awful clunky for us to have to keep 
going through this. And, and so I don't know if, if legal counsel can opine or say anything with that regard. Maybe it's just we're stuck with it and we have to do what we have to do. And if that's the case, that's fine. So I know I'm not talking to the specific issue, Madam Chair, and I apologize, but I, I think a lot of times the reason we struggle with these decisions is it just doesn't feel like we're, we're doing a process properly. It's a yay or nay. Um, I don't know. I mean, instinctually, I, I, I certainly would defer to the to the uh, Commissioner Burroughs because it's his region and he knows it just as you know better than probably anybody. Um, but having said that, it would be nice to know that we aren't denying anybody an opportunity to participate. Sure. Madam Chair, one, one thing that I think thing that I think is important is that we don't bog and it, it's the same as in my day job as county commissioner we don't want to bog our departments and our people on the ground down with like unnecessary committees and meetings when we kind of know the ultimate outcome probably um i would like to think of us as that course filter for these variances and these appeals and these petitions that come through that we provide kind of our uh input and and insight into that petition and and not just have a blanket process that says, you know, every petition that comes through department, you need to form a working group meeting and dedicate staff. And, and I think it's important that we be that course filter to kind of sift some of these petitions out. Commissioner Siebel. Oh, Madam Chair, just to comment on Commissioner Burroughs, I, I, I agree with that. I think we should be the, the course filter. However, uh, you know, the, the idea if, if we, we can throw it out or we can make make rules, if, if we make the, the citizen committee kind of part of the next step that it goes to, if we choose, we haven't filtered it out, we choose to move it forward to make the citizen group part of it, because that's that's kind of becoming a standard, I think. And I think to uh, Commissioner Tabor's, or Vice Chair Tabor's point, we get more public involvement, because what happens now, if we move forward with the rule, goes into the rulemaking process, we get public comment. If we get to the end of that, which which can be, which involves a ton of work, with all the public comment and we don't like because it was a very specific petition we don't like where it was then we've got to if if we don't like the outcome of that then we've got to circle all the way back around and start the process again so i really think this this idea of the public commission after our commission says yay we want to go ahead with the rulemaking the next you know potentially the next step and maybe it's not every case is that that public commission but i really do support the the, the public working groups involvement in these because i don't think you know, we, we never hear from all the stakeholders until we get that done. And, and the, the department's done a fantastic job from my uh, from my experience in putting those together and getting all the stakeholders, the recreationalists, property owners, the fishermen, everyone at the table. Thanks. Mr. Walsh. Yeah, uh, Chair Robinson, Chair. I, just, uh, I would just point out that uh, in the case uh, for Commissioner Siebel, that in the case of the Boulder River, you had a law firm or two law firms involved. You had many stakeholders involved in the petition process itself. We heard a lot of feedback from, from those constituencies prior to our meeting. And I would encourage Sarah and the team here at FWP to think about, you know, like can we improve, I'm with Commissioner Tabor 100% that, you know, we're spending a lot of our time right now on a petition that's been sponsored by an individual uh, on a topic that was really adjudicated. 10 or 11 years ago. And it feels like, you know, this should go through the county commissioner. There should be a individual fish and wildlife commissioner that's sponsoring the petition or give us some uh, filter before it gets to this point. One last thing and then I'll be quiet. I, I don't know if everybody received all the comment in regards to these petitions that are coming forward for, I, I, don't, I just didn't know how specific it was to the, the region two email address. Fair. It was it was probably about a hundred to one opposition to support that I received in my emails. So. Did not. Okay. Yeah, a hundred in opposition of the the petition. So. Ma so Madam we have Chair, a I, um, Mr. Thomas, I we have a motion, and so when I come out go out for public comment, I'll give you a chance to to comment on the motion. Any other yes, questions or comments before 
Mr. Thomas, if you want to comment to the motion. That was my fault. I accidentally did that. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes, ma'am. After hearing the information. Okay, here, now you're you're on again. After so hearing ahead. after hearing the information that has been brought forth in this, I am not a uh, a fisherman or a real boater, and I was just requesting this. And the information, particularly which Mr. Burroughs has brought forth, that there is significant opposition, much more than I thought. Can I withdraw this petition and save everybody a lot of heartache? Yes, that is a possibility if you would like to withdraw it. I think that's in the best public interest. Uh, we don't want to have everybody go into a bunch of meetings and I think it's been demonstrated by your discussion here that this is not something that would be uh, uh, acceptable socially. All right, well, thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Siebel. Uh, Madam Chair, just a point. Uh, I wanted to comment that, and I appreciate that Commissioner Burroughs got a lot of public comment on this. I did not. I'm not sure if any of the other commissioners did. And as much as we can, uh, I, I usually look online to see the collection of comments sent to the department in any way that we can consolidate comments. And I know a lot of us get individual comments uh, to our emails and not sure who else gets them. But uh, that, you know, I, I didn't, I don't think I got a single email regarding this issue, obviously being in Region 5. So if there's any way we can share those, or figure out a better way, a more efficient way to share uh, the comments, especially region specific stuff, that'd be great. Thank you. Madam Chair. Can can you hear me? Or? I can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you respond back. Um, so I'm kind of back on, on the core Thing we talked about in that is process, you know, not, and I think this was, you know, handled superbly, you know, I too would have liked to have seen those comments, it would have been more compelling, but it feels like since this is a rhythm that we're getting into, it might be worth either flow charting or something. I believe me, Commissioner Burroughs, I am not interested in spending a lot of state resources and sending people on wild missions. Having done that, said that, there's been a number of occasions where um, some really legitimate information came up after a very brief conversation and, and things weren't fully taken into account. And so uh, one of the things I think most of us that have been on this commission for a little bit of is we've been working on is real hard is transparency and really valuing public input so that people feel like they have a say in it. Um, you know, when I look back on church slew, um, one of the things that I think I learned, and it's going to be my, my request of the department, is we've got to give good, tight guidelines so that we don't allow the committee to come up with rec unimplementable recommendations. If there was a flaw relative to that, it wasn't the process, it wasn't the facilitation. Those, I think they did a superb job, and I think the citizens involved did a great job, but they came to a conclusion that effectively was unenforceable. And so, so we probably need to tighten the kind of guidance and direction that we give those folks so that they come out with uh, something that's actionable on the part of the commission. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe the best way to handle this is to just ask the uh, department if, if for a little bit more time, or maybe we could do an, uh, some other approach to this, because I just want the process to have meaning and people feel like their voices are being heard and, and they're included on these major decisions as it affects the areas they live in. I think I want Sarah to uh, speak to this because statutorily, I think we have a very short timeline of giving an answer to a petitioner. And so I think there could be some hopeful, it have, would it have to be legislative? Thanks. Yes, yeah. so the, it, the process is in statute. There's There's nothing we can, do about it. And I, but I am um, happy to explain a little bit more background. The statutes just when I um, shared those orientation materials with everybody, the um, statutes on the rulemaking, and there is a specific statute on petitions for rulemaking are in those materials. And I'm happy to talk about it more with you guys and answer questions and go over. There's a bunch of case law on this subject. So, okay. 
And maybe we could have uh, some time have just a call to dis to kind of work through this process. Sure so, oh, so one thing Madam that I Chair. do think is important, though, is uh, like uh, the commissioners online said, I think it's important that we all see kind of the same comments and information because I didn't get any. I, the only thing I got was the county commissioner's comment on church slew, and I'm sure Commissioner Tabor probably got pounded on that. Same as on the Fitteru petition. I, I probably received 100 comments on it. And if you guys didn't see even close to that, that would make it difficult for us to come in here kind of with the same information basis and make these decisions so real quick before um so the other all the other items go out for public comment but i'm assuming the petition since we hadn't acted on it doesn't go out to public comment so that's where the problem is because those are the comments that we're seeing are the official public comments and we get we get constant individual emails so i don't really know if we can come up with a solution to that but anyway, Dustin, did you have something? Yeah, Madam Chair, just a, a comment and then a commitment. Um, so the department, you know, is, is certainly as long as we were dealing with petitions, is the same frustration that the commission public has with the process. And Sarah pointed out, you know, the current process is locked in statute, but we're good at changing statutes when we have good reason to do so. And so my commitment on you know, the heels of that comment is, is uh, we will work with staff the public and the commission to see if we can come up with a model and a process that makes sense put that into work on that during the interim it's too late in this legislative session for us to bring a proposal like that but our commitment is is we'll work with with anybody who wants to work on this and see if we can't come up with um, a change that provides for a process that's easier to administer easier for folks to apply to uh, satisfies the transparency requirements and the involvement of the public demands and is administratively efficient so again our, we share the frustration and our commitment is, is we'll, we'll work on that with all parties interested over the interim and see if we can't get an agency bill next time we get this result i i really think that um having madam chair having it out for public comment first i mean just on the petition itself not would be helpful okay sure robinson also just to have some madam staff. chair Right. I would have loved it for Brandy's point of view before. I know, but they don't take a stand on it. That's the problem. But yeah, I will let you do just a little short closing, uh, Mr. Thomas. Oh. Yes, I think I think the responsibility for this uh, that discussion befalls me. I didn't do enough homework on this. I should have specifically got a hold of Commissioner Burroughs before I went forward with this permit per petition. And it appears to me that we could maybe in the petitions have a checklist. Have you contacted your county commissioner? How many people are here? Uh, how many folks are interested in this? Something for the petitioner to do other than just their own uh, particular individual thought. So I think the uh, air here befalls me and not any of the commissioners. That's fine. We're not, we're not putting blame on anyone. We're just, um trying to figure out how to simplify the process and we appreciate it. So thank you for your petition and for your comments. We're not taking action on it. So, but well, I'm not taking action. I just, it's more just kind of on the bigger process, what you guys are talking about. And I know, but I, I only take comment on, on action items. So. So the last thing that we have on our agenda is items that are not on the agenda. So if there's anyone here who would like to speak wow. to items not on the agenda. Speak what I was going to say for this part. If it wasn't on the agenda, you can't. It's not on the agenda. It's, it's talking about Tabor and, and his idea of what the constraints are. Of okay, the so you can come up to the podium and have okay. for two minutes of your Thank you. Commissioner Tabor is talking about the guidelines to help people to be more clear about what they present to you and it being in the guides of something you can actually do about, right? Um, but Commissioner Walsh you know, even commented after everybody decided that that was 
not within the check boxes on church slew, that he wasn't hundred percent sure if, if all of that was out of the parameter of fishing game. So I would just encourage whatever, because I even feel like that as I've been getting into this to, to really dissect and figure out what is it that the fishing game can do and can't do. And also maybe to figure out where a person can go from there then, you know, because right now this process is the only thing that I was presented as, as an avenue. And quite honestly, I'm not 100% sure if, if it was the right avenue. And I, I am not 100% sure if the, the thing that Church Sloop came up with and the reasons that you guys aren't accepting it is actually correct. I, I don't personally, from what everything I'm gathering, what I'm seeing, I'm I don't I'm not in agreement. And and I just trying to help. I mean, I'm I'm not going to change anything. And I I get the feeling that you're kind of tired of me at this point. But um, <laughs> no, just trying to follow process. Yeah, I apologize, but it sounds like your process needs some enhancement, and that's what I'm noticing as well. That's what that gentleman was noticing and and the state as it's growing and like what Burroughs is talking about Commissioner Burroughs is talking about is man there's just such a need for efficiency ultimate efficiency right but again Commissioner Walsh not being 100% sure if that was or wasn't in the bounds of fish and game and but it's already been taken off the table that's that's kind of hard to see as a member of the public I have to admit <laughs> I know that I'm a little biased on that issue, but that's not okay. good, I don't think. Thank you. Are there any other comments on anything that wasn't on the agenda? Madam Chair. Oh, yeah. I just, uh, in doing the research for the the walleye and the, and the perch issue, I noticed there is a lot of, I think, going down the entire Missouri River Basin, it looks like there needs to be some simplification of the rules. Because uh, as you, if you look at- you wait, I'm gonna wait and see if there's any public comment on something not oh. on the agenda, then you can go- But this was <laughs> not on the agenda. No, I know, but you're, you're <laughs> okay. not public. All right, sorry. <laughs> Is there any public who would like to speak to any issues that are not on the agenda? Okay, anyone online? Okay. Oh, maybe in Region 2, I'm assuming. Okay. Region 2, do you have some kind of comments or are you? Well, Madam Chair, it's just a quick clarif question, clarification. I believe there were two petitions regarding the Bitterroot River. And I, I, I may have missed something as to one of those petitions, whether or not they've both been addressed. We, the, the petitioner is ill and, and wanted it moved to the April meeting, the other one. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Chair, we do have one more, Craig. Okay. Uh, one comment that's not on the agenda. Okay. I would like to thank the commission for how well they are taking care of the Gates uh, uh, Park on the Blackfoot, as well as the, as the uh, Salmon Lake entry there, those are, uh, were dedicated to peers that perished in logging jobs. And after I was up there recently, I thought the staff that is caring for them, the maintenance crew has been doing an exceptional job. It's, it's proud to have that, those pieces of property uh, in the hands of the Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Thank you. Other public comments for items on, not on the agenda? Okay. All right, Commissioner Williams. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. It was just more or less a, a simplification of, I think it looks like it would be an enforcement nightmare where your quotas for your fisheries or when you're fishing, if you cross a bridge, all of a sudden the rules change. And in noticing it, sometimes there's places where you could be over your quota for the day if you cross just to even get out. And I just, I was thinking if they're going through the management plan for that Missouri River, the entire river basin is maybe review that and just see if there's some, some way of simplifying it. And I 
think I'll okay. approve. Well, it, if it's items not on the agenda. Okay. I'll allow it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> come, I, okay. Come, up, come up to the podium, please. Uh, Brian Nielsen. Um, with uh, Montana Family. I was born and raised in Great Falls, and um, I see your point too about um, the concerns of managing Missouri River, but from Great Falls to Holter Dam River changes dramatically, and the fish populations are dramatic. Um, you know, there's portions where we're trying to manage it for you know large brown trout, um, and then there's walleye, sauger below Maroni, and all the way up to Bowfinger from Goldeye. So it would be it needs to to kind of keep. Well, yeah, yeah, just a thought. Yeah, Thank you. No, and I wouldn't want to change the science. Gotcha. Just anyhow. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do any of the commissioners have anything else? Thank you, everyone. And uh, if we have nothing else, I guess the meeting is adjourned. What is our date for our next meeting? Oh, we had one last. Is it two weeks or one additional one? Oh, sure. I'll take. I'll take it. Gregory, go ahead. Well, okay, go ahead as uh, items not on the agenda. Okay, um, I wanted to talk to the commission about the uh, our super tags, and, and I believe they've been somewhat corrupted from what I've been told. I have a witness. That, that Montana super tag, the $5 one, you know, you know, that was created to give an even chance to the average person in Montana or wherever uh, to get a super tag, like the one auctioned off by the Foundation for North American Wild Sheep, FNAS, yearly for close to half a million dollars. Okay, now my, my rancher buddy that belongs to FNAS, he goes to their banquet yearly. Uh, well, he told me that the, uh, the winner of Montana's tag, the super tag, has been buying $25,000 worth of these tags. And that I believe he said that, that he had, this fellow had won it twice in three years, their $5 tags. You know, and uh, I believe that with 5,000 chances from $25,000 in purchases, that he's actually buying it and stacking the deck, you know, where, where the average uh, person doesn't have a chance. Okay, and I have no way to check on these numbers. You know, and and or how many people are actually doing that? But I believe that a five dollar super tag chances should be limited to twenty per person per species. Okay, as most Montanans uh, don't really make twenty five thousand a year. A lot of them I know. You know, so a lot of my friends that hunt. After I've been asking them about this for the last month, I found out that I only know one person that buys these super tags besides me, and he only bought two. And, he's, and everybody else that I know on these construction jobs and around, uh, by the way, my name is Greg Hill. I forgot to identify myself. I'm in the Gallatin Canyon. But all these guys, they told me that they hunt, but they don't buy super tags because they feel it's a ripoff and it's rigged. And then, but they couldn't tell me why, you know, but that's what they say. But the $5 super tag was promised to be an even chance, not a cash cow. And the FNAS super tag is the cash cow. That's the one that's supposed to go for a half a million. You know, so the, okay. the $5 super tag has a loophole in it now for the rich to stack the deck against the working Joe, you know, uh, in my opinion, you know, and I have been wrong. Uh, but right. I want you to Thank look you. at this, if you guys would look at this and look at closing this loophole. Okay. Thank you. I will, I will have them look into that. Thank you. Our next commission meeting is April 18th. Calendar, do you have an already? Uh, yeah, Chair Robinson, I, I have a significant conflict that's developed for April 18th, so I did ask Clint to pull the uh, okay. commissioners to see if we can move that, but if not, I, I'll understand. Okay, we'll Thanks. check it out and see see what works. So I guess just let me know if anybody else has a conflict or what, what your conflicts are around that date. So, okay. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.